very similar board. In fact, we have two boards that are in conjunction with health and the uh, hospital, who of course is owned by Huntsville Hospital, so they're owned by the same entity. Now, we have a, the Health Care Authority of Morgan County Hospital Board, Decatur Morgan County Board. I have requested from our code what the authority of that board is, and it goes back to Resolution 92095, the Health Care Authorities Act of 1982, as amended by the state of Alabama. Uh, I do believe this is a board that is very similar to the board in Madison County. Um, and I will open it for comment, but I will say this. I am not a medical doctor, and I support the medical doctors weighing in. I think it's very important. Oh, let me weigh this in as well. In 2018, early 2018, we, the city of Decatur, began paying a medical doctor to be our medical director. Medical director. His name is Dr. Solis. I have left various messages with him to get back with us. Uh, he has yet to call us back. So we actually do pay him a salary. He is a medical doctor that I would love to hear his opinion as well. Since I am not a medical doctor, I would love to hear those opinions of this board. There is another board of the hospital and also Dr. Solis that we pay from the city general fund. Uh, so I guess we're awaiting Madison County. I am awaiting Madison County's announcement. But I'll open it up to discussion. And sorry for the public, we will have no public discussion until the council comes together with some sort of something to consider. So, council, open it up. And forgive me, uh, the handout that we had last week, I did not bring back with me. Do we have any additional copies? I'm not sure what handout. The ordinance that was it a sample of what we can do? Herman, I don't know if they have any yet. It was the first I time. Mean, you want to here, you use yours. And, and, and I'm sorry, I mean, I, I really just kind of thought we'd have yeah, something new to work on today. Thank you. Hi, um, I can start this. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I think last week we had the opportunity to be at the forefront of this. Um, and it's not a race by any stroke of the imagination, but we brought this uh, to the council and we um, discussed this, and it was an opportunity for us to sort of set the tone as far as safety and health, not, not only here in Cater, but uh, around the state. Since that time, and we have a sample ordinance that Herman gave us, which is a good template to start with, and it gave us a basis for us to uh, begin to, to work, with, work off of. Since that time, though, we've had several cities to pass ordinances that require masks in, in public places. So now we have other templates to work off of. And if you look through the Mobile and you look through um, Tuscaloosa, you see that I think that they're trying to accomplish the same things that we're trying to accomplish. And in doing so, it, to me, it's, it's very simple. And I think that Herman, as, a, uh, as our city attorney, knows that oftentimes we will um, take ordinances from other cities and modify that to meet our needs. I think that uh, I was talking to Herman this morning, I was telling him earlier this morning that I was going through the Tuscaloosa ordinance again. It is, I think it's comprehensive. I, the only part that I don't like is the uh, $25 fine. I do think that um, we should uh, apply this just as we do uh, with our smoking ordinance. When someone comes into a mom and pop or a Walmart or a Publix or any other place, if they're smoking, they're simply asked to leave. And if they don't leave, then they'll call the police, I'm sure. Um, but the fact is, is that uh, we have a $500 fine associated with our smoking ordinance. Is that, that's accurate as Herman? That's what I think. Uh, um, and I'm not trying to get there. I'm just trying to get people to comply. And, and in a nutshell, that's it. Um, I hope that our, in the end, we don't um, assess any fines. That, that, that's my position, I, and, and I just hope that people comply. And the thing that we talked about, I was talking with someone the other week, is that most people are inclined to follow the law. Re regardless of whether they agree with it or not, most people are inclined to follow the law. And hopefully that's what happens in this regard. So I think that we could take a template such as the uh, Tuscaloosa one, um, and, and we could follow it possibly add it or 
massage it with the one that we had before, but I think that we've got something that we can work off of now that we can put something together very quickly and have something um, that would protect the citizens of our community. Uh, I think that uh, we have uh, wasted, it's my opinion, I think that we have wasted time and I think that as a result, people will get sick um, in just this week's time that we've uh, not enforced this. So that's kind of where I am. And, and uh, so I've made no secret where I am. And uh, I do want an ordinance. I do want something that protects us uh, and our citizens uh, particularly. But I want it to be a temporary fix. I want it to be a 30-day, 45-day uh, max that I'm looking at a 30-day span. And uh, at that point, when, it, when we hit the 30-day point, uh, if we have to um, look at that again, if, if, our, you know, if the numbers have gone down and we feel that we can lift this, then maybe we can do that. But uh, I think that we re-examine this at, at a 30-day period and move from there. Yeah, Council nice. President Page. Yes, Kristen. Yes, um, from what I understood, we were going to go line by line. I think that's what Charles, maybe even Billy was asking for tonight. I think Charles asked for it maybe that we would go through this one that was currently proposed. Yes, he did last Tuesday. I'm happy with that if you folks are. I mean, we can do that. Um, it doesn't matter to me. I, we, we need something that is going to act as a safeguard for our citizens. That, so if we need to go, by, go through it line by line or decide that we want to um, look at something different, uh, just whatever we need to do, I just think that we need to move forward. Permanent Chip, I'm going to need a copy of that as well. I must have left mine in the car of your sample that we can get on. I, I gave Charles the one I had. You want so. I'll, I'll go up there and print it I'll be back. That's fine. I, if someone else would like to read line for line, I don't mind giving Charles. my input, but I don't have it That's to read. Right. I can read it on my phone, but it's very hey, small. Herman, um, bring just multiple copies if you would. Would you bring multiple, multiple copies if you would? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll go line for line then. Whereas Decatur Morgan County has seen a significant spike in the number of COVID-19 cases over the past few weeks, whereas this is a continued need for residents to protect themselves and others from risk relating to the COVID-19 virus, whereas there is a continued need for businesses to remain open and safe for their patrons and employees, whereas the city council recognizes the possibility and the need to avoid another shutdown of our economy, and whereas Decatur Morgan County has expressed a spike in the number of cases of COVID-19 at a level which is higher than most Alabama counties, and whereas after weighing the available information, consulting with the Alabama Department of Public Health and other healthcare professionals, and seeking guidance from residents and business owners of the city of Decatur, concludes that the safety of the citizens and the economy is, the be is best protected by all residents and visitors wearing facial coverings slash masks in public, sanitizing hands, and practicing social physical distancing. That is the first several anything there that anyone would like to change. I, I don't see anything in there. And, and let me state, in the last week or two, there's been numerous studies reported that the sooner that we can stem the tide of this virus, the faster the economy will recover. It, it's expected a very specific positive effects on the economy. Mm -hmm. And I will follow up with Judy Smith. I did speak to her today. I, I left, I, I can find the exact numbers. They have gone up in the state of Alabama and Morgan County. Uh, our hospital numbers have also increased. I think there was a 10 o'clock press conference that addressed that. Uh, therefore, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Decatur as follows. Uh, and Chip, let me ask, is this a, a combination, as, as I understood of, at the time, Union Springs, Montgomery, Birmingham, there could have been a few. Is this kind of, is this, was this standard? Herman drafted voting? it, but it was, I think it borrowed heavily from uh, Montgomery because okay. Birmingham's had been, had already uh, had some problems with it because of, um, it, it didn't make exceptions in public for people who were still social distanced. And, but I think Montgomery at, was the strongest one he borrowed from. And so. Montgomery itself was actually an executive order from the mayor, not a council decision. I think it, Union Springs at the time and Birmingham were council decisions. Right. I didn't hear him mention Union Springs, but I, I know Mo, Mobile was being discussed and Montgomery was being discussed. And Mobile and Tuscaloosa has since been passed. Right. Since last week. 
Okay. It Tuscaloosa is had not been when we were doing this. Okay. It is ordered that the following face covering mask order be implemented in the corporate limits of the city of Decatur, Alabama, effective Friday, July 3rd. That has got to be, of course, Stace. amended. Uh, are you, anyone have a problem with that? Of course, I guess we would have to decide on a date for it to be implemented. But right. that can be at the end. I, I would assume, and, and I, I think Mr. Jackson has heard this from me, and maybe some of you have. I don't think we should make this permanent in any way. Stace. So my statement is Stace. for whatever date it gets past 30 days. Let me get one if, for If the virus Stace. doesn't disappear and it becomes necessary to extend it, then it requires a vote to extend it, say another 30 days. I don't have a problem with that at all. I agree with that as a matter of fact. And I would like to also, at the end of those 30 days, I totally agree with you, uh, fill it in need that these boards that we have, that we appoint people to, also our medical director that we pay from the city of Decatur, at the end of that 30 days, give us their perspective of where we are. And, and what my personal guesswork would be, this probably end up being in place no less than 90 days, because they don't think the virus is going to stem anytime soon. The evidence we've seen lately is continued infections. And again, I don't disagree with you on that, but I do think that and I, I know I'm not, you're not contradicting what, I, what we said, but I do think that we need to break it up in 30-day cycles so that uh, it, just in case, you know, we do see a, uh, a turn back in the numbers uh, that we can, uh, we can address it at that time. But I, I think that uh, it needs to be temporary at best. I think that's addressed at the end. Chip, uh, if we vote on something that's 30 days from the date we vote, is that applicable by law or does there have to be a waiting period? It, it goes into effect, an ordinance goes into effect when it's published in the paper unless you pick a different date for it to go into effect. So, so the, date, the date actually attached would be determined by what date it could get printed? Correct. That, that's when they, that's when ordinances go into effect unless you set another effective date in the ordinance. Now, the, I think the Tuscaloosa ordinance that, uh, that I have that we're getting copies of said that it went into effect upon rat, uh, ratification of that ordinance. It, I, I've always operated under as I mean, soon as I'm it gets as not, soon as it gets published. That's fine. So. I'm just I'm, I think that's what uh, that says unless I read. Uh, what are you under the impression that at that time when it is once it is given to a uh, Stacy runs them. It's usually within two or three days. Yeah, basically. Is there a law? I'm sure it's in the Constitution or that the state would mandate that for us. To have it published. Uh, I'll continue on. Well, number one, definitions. The definitions used in this order are as follows. Face covering slash mask. So much, a device to cover the nose so and much. mouth of a person to impede the spread of saliva or other fluids during speaking, coughing, sneezing, or other uh, intentional or involuntary actions. Medical grade masks are not required and are in fact discouraged for under this order as they are in short supply and should generally be reserved for high risk first responders and healthcare workers or those coming in direct contact with suspected COVID-19 patients. Anyone have a problem with that? That's just, thank you, Herman. And I, Herman probably needs a copy of that too, but that's just the Tuscaloosa form. That looks very No, no questions with uh, definitions that first paragraph. Coverings may be fashioned from scarves, bandanas, or other suitable fabrics. The face covering must cover the mouth and nose uh, of the wearer. Reusable face I'm, coverings I'm or masks must be kept say. clean and sanitary, including regular regular washings at least daily. Madam President, I have a problem with that statement. Okay. I don't know how we're going to ensure that people wash them at least daily. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about... So what wordage would you recommend? If you're going to leave it, I would say reusable face coverings or masks must be kept clean and sanitary, period. Thank you. I'm okay with that. I, I think we start getting too specific about people's variations of hygiene. You, you're getting into areas Agreed. can't be controlled. Okay, so do we have a notation of that? Thank you. Uh, two, face coverings required in public places. 
All persons shall be required to wear face mask coverings it, or face or coverings or mask in the following public places within the city corporate limits. A, indoor spaces of business, businesses or venues open to the general public, including but not limited to stores, bars, restaurants, in parentheses C, exception 3B after restaurants, entertainment venues, public meeting spaces, city government buildings, civic centers, etc. Anyone have comments for that? Well, I believe we should only be doing it for government buildings. You don't believe we should be doing I it? I do believe okay. we should only be doing it for government buildings. What about a movie theater? I'm only saying that we have the right to do it for uh, the buildings in which we enforce. Where I'm going with this, if a movie theater is doing business and you got people sitting in there side by side and no mask on, that defeats the purpose. He's saying we can't do that. I'm no. saying we should do that. Oh, we should do that. Whatever y'all think is best. I oh, think. no, I, I mean, I, I don't agree with him on that, but I I, I, I just I thought I'd, you know, I'll let him see the court too. We'll notate that there were two different opinions on that. But there's Mr. Art's opinion and... And, and we will talk about that once we... And, and there's going to be another exception we come to in here. My thinking is going to be a little bit close to Chuck's, but I think we should err on the side of caution. And, and I'll tell you what that is now, because when we come to it, when you go to a place to eat, I've done it twice since the virus began. In both cases, I knew I was meeting someone and going to a place I had higher risk than staying at home, okay? To expect somebody to go into a place to eat and have the mask on and five minutes later off, five minutes later on, five minutes later off, I think you're, you're, you're knowingly taking an acceptable risk in that case or you just stay away. I think expecting somebody who's gone to a place to eat to have the mask on and off is creating problems. And I apologize for looking away. I just received a text that would uh, tell us what the Madison County uh, health board has I, I can't get the whole thing obviously there's a statement um, so if someone could uh, look that up for us and we'll read what they have just passed and when that goes into effect on Madison County cities uh, B transportation services available to the general public including mass transit uh, para transit taxis or rideshare services which in our ordinance we do say over and yeah, um, and my question there, Herman, does Norcott, where are you, Herman? I saw you move. Okay, we have Somebody asked for the Tuscaloosa ordinance and they okay. went to get Chip, it. My question is, Norcott will be our public transportation here. They have a board. Um, have they weighed in at all on what their thoughts are? And I believe they are already doing the social distances. They will only take one or two riders per bus. They have changed their policies to to a try to social distance, but I, I don't know what those are. I, I believe that's what I saw written was it was like one or two persons per trip. Okay. Right, it, it's, it's something like that. I would like to see what their board has recommended for transportation on their buses. I think that's very important since they are our public transportation. Any other questions on that one, B? C, outdoor areas open to the general public where 10 or more persons are gathered and unable to maintain a distance of six or more feet between persons not from the same household. Any questions there? Yeah, let, let's talk about that just a minute. And, and I do think when we're done here that we should take some of these bizarre examples that have been said to us and cite that this is not our intent. Now, for example, in here, what is our intent at the ball fields, for example? If somebody's out there on the ball field playing softball, most of them is more than six feet apart. I don't think we necessarily want to get into regulating, trying to get people who are physically exerting wearing masks. And again, I would question, and Chip, if you could find this out, each of those Dixie Girl softball, baseball, they have their own individual boards. Uh, I would like to see if that board, those boards, excuse me, have passed any standards that they go by when playing. Uh, I agree with you, Charles. I don't know that being outside, I think that's, that's really getting to the I think outside is, if you're social distancing, that should be sufficient enough. I'm not at all advocating that masks be everywhere you go. I think the coaches and associations are, are dictating other things like football. They're in much closer contact. But like on our city parks, there's not much done other than walking the trail and playing ball. Am I correct? 
But if you're looking at it just for, I guess, to get some guidance, if you're talking about all the potential leagues that could be playing at Wilson Morgan or all the travel ball teams that could be playing, that's a lot of people together. What are their roles for? No, so my, I, my, my one would be the city ran Dixie Girl softball, for instance. They have it into a okay. board, the baseball board. What they are doing, I would think that at that point, if they're coming in for a tournament, would be up to the city because that is a city owned right, facility. Right, okay. uh, and we would make those. Or with Mr. Lakes uh, in his board, maybe some recommendations. But again, if, and I know Dixie Girl have a board, and I know the baseball have a board right. independent. I'd like to see what their standards are and what they're requiring now because that may, they may be doing that now. I don't I I know no idea. Parks and Rec adopted, because I drafted part of it, they adopted I the. One moment, please. That's probably just. They adopted the uh, CDC and health department guidelines. There's a, a sheet that they're required, and that's what Parks and Rec adopted for anybody using our baseball, our baseball and softball facilities. So would it be appropriate to defer to their policy on those things? But I think, though, where we're, where we're getting off here is that basically every entity, uh, such as transportation, NARCOG, is going to have their own board. And too many different policies. And, and our job in this particular, if we're going to adopt this and we're going to move forward, this is basically an oversight uh, situation. And um, if, you know, and again, I keep bouncing back to the smoking ordinance, but even though they have their own board and they might have chosen something different than the city chose with a smoking policy, they're not allowed to smoke on those buses. And I, I it's just my opinion that we have to, if we're going to curb, you know, if we're going to push this thing back in Decatur, we've got to implement it in as many places as we possibly can uh, within reason. And what, so, how do you feel about children at the playground and, and play, ball players on the ball field? I mean, you know, I have mixed emotions about that because I, I do, uh, you know, being a former uh, ball player myself, you know, when, you know, you can stay within, you can stay, keep a six foot distance in most situations, but when that person sliding into second base and you come into close contact with that person, I mean, you know, you're in close contact. And if that one person has it, whether it's asymptomatic or not, then, you know, it's possible that it's passed on at that particular point. So I just, uh, you know, I don't know that, um, you know, if it's a basketball uh, game or, I mean, uh, again, and I know that sounds unreasonable, but uh, I just think that at this particular point, if we're going to do it, it has to be in place to protect our citizens. And, uh, and, and I think that's what it does, even on a baseball field. So we we mark this to come back to it, try to figure it out. We can more. come back and figure it out, or I mean, again, it's going to go to the majority. But uh, I just think that uh, if we're going to try to protect our citizens, uh, you know, there's going to be contact, and and you can try to maintain that six foot distance, but uh, there's going to be sweat, and there's going to be, uh, you know, sliding into second base and a lot of contact. And I just think that you make good points. I'm just not we have to sure where I am. Yeah. I don't disagree with Mr. Jackson. Yeah. I just think I'd like to see what they have in place, too. To, I, you know. I'm, not, I'm not arguing. I'm just saying, you know, that we have to, I'm not arguing and saying yes, that we shouldn't. We just, we have to look at the fact that we are going to serve as an oversight board, basically, yes, um, in this particular regard. Thank you, and I agree with that. So, uh, Paige, three. can I ask one question? Yes. So are you looking to have something written up that makes exceptions for all these things, or just an information purpose, what they're doing, so you can make your mind up on how to, because it would be drafted differently? That was a question. Well, Either of, any of you, I, I don't. If we're going to start I mean, writing it down, or we, do you want us to build in all these exceptions, or do you want us to just get that for information the, purposes the and let you know? Other cities have exceptions, and um, you know, I think that if we're going to put in an exception, then it needs to be stated that we have an, ex an exception in there. I personally don't agree with that particular exception, and, and again, that's going to have to be discussed by the council. But uh, I think that if there's an exception, it needs to be stated what that exception is. That's just my personal opinion. Mr. Uh, Marks, do you have the uh, Madison statement? Madison, does uh, anyone I ask for questions, someone to? Do you have it? It is online now. Well, I, I can only get a portion of it. Uh, I'm going to give it. I'll send the link. Okay, I'm oh, sorry. I think it'd be beneficial for us to uh, at least look at what they have passed now. Thank you, guys. Let's 
let's see, face covering requirement in Madison County effective Tuesday, July 7th for immediate release. Uh, the contact is a doctor. Madison County Health Officers, uh, Dr. Karen Landers has issued a health order requiring most people to wear face coverings in public places in Madison County to help prevent the spread of the Corona-19 virus. The order takes effect on July 7th at 5 p.m. in the afternoon. We need to do all we can to limit the spread of COVID-19. State Health Officer, Dr. Scott Harris, and until we have a vaccine or treatment for COVID-19, wearing a face covering is in public. Sorry, I had a call. Um, until we have a vaccine or treatment for COVID-19, wearing a face covering in public is a key measure we have available to prevent transmission of the virus. This health order has the unanimous support of the Madison County Board of Health, Huntsville Mayor Tommy Battle, Madison Mayor Paul Findlay, and County Commission Chair Dale Strong. This is a simple math problem, said Mayor Battle. Since June 16th, the number of positive cases in Madison County has tripled and the number of hospitalizations has increased 660%. We need to take precautionary measures such as wearing face coverings, dis uh, distancing six foot, and hand washing to provide a safe environment, environment for our citizens. And we, would, we need to work together for the balance of personal uh, uh, venues and e for the economic health with personal responsibility is still paramount. I could read it all. I can get to the meat of it. Uh, face covering is required in Madison County locations, indoor spaces of businesses or venues open to the public, including stores, bars, restaurants, entertainment venues, public meeting spaces, and government buildings. B, transportation services available to the public, including mass transit, uh, paratransit, taxi, and or ride share services. Number three, outdoor areas open to the public. Ten or more persons are gathered and where people are unable to maintain a distance of six or more feet between persons uh, or not, not by the same, the same household. household. It, it is, looks like it's actually uh, mirroring what we just read. Exceptions to wearing face coverings or masks include children age two and under, persons while eating or drinking, uh, patients in examination rooms of medical offices, dental offices, clinics or hospitals where three examinations of the, where there are examinations of the mouth or nasal area is, necess is a necess necessity, I'm sorry. Uh, customers receiving hair services, temporary removal of face mask when needed to provide hair care. Uh, occasions when wearing a face covering poses a significant mental or physical health safety or security risk. These include worksite areas. Although not mandated, face coverings are strongly recommended for, uh, let's see, uh, congregations at worship services and for situations where people from different households are unable to or not unlikely to maintain a distance of six feet from each other. When effective communication is needed for the hearing impaired, persons and those speaking to a large group of persons provided the speaker can stay at least six feet away from that pers those pe persons. Indoor athletic facilities, patrons are not required to wear face coverings while activity, participating in activity in permitted athletic activity buildings, but employees in regular interaction with patrons are required to wear face coverings or masks. The last, private clubs and gathering not, not to open to the public where a consistent six foot distancing between patrons or persons from different households can be maintained. Parents, guardians, and caregivers must ensure the proper mask of children over the age of two in public places, ensuring face coverings do not pose a choking hazard for children and can be worn safely without obstructing a child's ability to breathe. Child care establishments and schools are to develop their face covering policies and procedures. All businesses and venues open to the public must provide a notice, state, a notice stating that face coverings are required inside the establishment. Signage is required to all public entrances. Dr. Harris said wearing a mask covering can help keep family, coworkers, and the community safe. 
This is the simplest act of kindness you can take for yourself, your family, your community, especially for those who are at high risk of contracting the virus. The Alabama Department of Public Health advises these actions to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And let's see, uh, the Centers for Disease, Disease Control, they have a link there. So that was unanimously passed by the Madison County Health Board uh, this afternoon. What I did not hear in there is any basic enforcement provisions. In other words, what's the penalty for not following it? Uh, I'm sure the media is on that. I don't have those answers. Uh, I was just violation of the state. Violation of the state. And I would assume those have already been addressed with the um, issuance of the 30 day. Would those penalties be in that? Uh, yeah, it's whatever their penalties are. Okay, and that would be the state of all. Uh, gotcha. um, would y'all like for me to go to the exceptions? It seems if I just read those, but I can read those again. I, I think the exceptions are. I would like to discuss, and that's children two years of age. You know, that we have said all along that it's very important how you take masks on and off. And yes, I believe that two years of age is entirely too young. Uh, because if you've got a three, or four, or five-year-old that's reaching up here, grabbing them out, oh, with your mask, pulling it off, that all you're going to do is, is run the risk of infecting them more. If we're going to do something like this, I would rather see an age something like six or seven. Well, as I go back to the first, Mr. Rard, we have a board that is exactly the same as Madison County. Uh, I would like. I would need that board that they need to convene and see if they want to make this a North Alabama effort or not. Um, I'm not opposed to continuing on with our efforts, but they would trump us and so would the state of Alabama on any uh, ordinance. But until they do that, what we're working and looking at is something that you're asking us to control. So we're looking at this, and if, it, if we're going to wait until they do something, that's fine. But I'm under the impression that you want to do something with an ordinance. Chuck's bringing up a good point. If we come to what we think should be done and they turn around and sit on it a month, that doesn't do much good. It doesn't, but now the thing is, is that when we start looking at through these ordinances, and Herman, correct me when I'm wrong, the ones that I've looked through, I, for whatever reason, I, and I was curious about that, but the, the starting point is two years of age. Have you found many different from that? And I don't know why that's the case, but. I saw was a little bit different. one that had an eight-year-old, 10-year-old, uh, talking about Okay. I mean, because these are very similar in nature. The reason for that is because not on the state department of public health is the one that. Okay. Okay. And I think at two years old, those children are generally still building their immunities. The child gets to eight years old, they're probably about as healthy a group as you're going to have. I think, uh, and, and I guess my point, Charles, and I don't disagree with that. My point was that you know, if you look through just ordinance after ordinance from different cities. For whatever reason, that starting point is two years of age, and and uh, I mean that's what I found. So well, what I'm what I'm concerned about, Charles, to your question, a child's immunity is developed at five years of age. To yours, I think that a three-year-old is not going to understand why they're wearing a mask. They're going to be touching their face. They're going to be doing everything we've asked them not to do, and that they're going to be running a, a bigger risk. And the only thing that I can think of is, is the people that have drafted this don't have young children. My take on that is I would yield to Dr. Scott Harris for that. I'm not a medical doctor. He is. I, and I don't know. I think I don't know if kids are different. I have no idea what that is. I would yield to the state for that uh, explanation. And I'll just simply say if I told my well, kids to do it, they were going to do it. Yeah. So that. Before, later on in the doctor, they talked about the it does. Would you like for me to pass the in between and go to section four? Okay. Let's let's keep going in the matter we're going. What we have that was not in that Madison County ordinance. Persons are working on a ladder or, or of a height. Persons are wearing other respiratory protection. Persons are engaging in heavy physical exertion. People are operating heavy equipment. Those would be exceptions that are written in this proposed or a proposal for us. Person, and the last one, persons are working in an environment where a face covering or mask hinders communication necessity, necessary for safety. 
And I don't have any problems with those, Ms. Bibby. And, and let me, since we're about ready to start on F, let me take the opportunity to attempt to tie B and F together. I said earlier, I've eaten two meals outside the house since this thing began. I knowingly knew I was taking a risk when I went in some place to eat, okay? So nobody's gonna go into a place to eat that doesn't think they're taking a risk and that mask on and off is a bit difficult. Then you add number F. In a perfect world, places of worship wouldn't be different. In this country, we have defined a very strict line between government and religion on certain matters. And people are making the choice to go worship once they, they go in the doors of that church or whatever. So I think either one of those would be the same exception. that We should stay away from forcing the mask in those places. That's what the exception is. That's what we're saying. We're not going to force it there. Yeah. But, but on the eating and drinking, it says in between if somebody, you know, comes within six feet, they're expected to put their mask back on. See what I'm getting at? You, you've already entered a place that you said I'm willing to take that risk. I believe that's addressed later on too, more specifically yeah. uh, with eating, uh, and we'll get there. Uh, noted, Charles. That, that and and, and I'm, I, I'm not advocating we should do anything that changes our divisions between church and state. Please don't misunderstand me. I, I, it's not whether or not we should, it's the fact that it's gonna go down a dead end path. And personally, I, you know, again, I would rather see stronger with F but I would like, at least uh, like for us to put in the wording of strongly encourage. Maybe we encourage, sure. Strongly encourage. I, I'm okay with that aspect of it. And I'll go back to the Madison County. I believe they worded it as, well, they did, I remember reading it. Um, they did strongly encourage yes. uh, that. And again, I'm assuming since she is the, uh, the doctor for Madison County, the health department, that she has been in contact with Dr. Harris. Uh, F, and I'll read it, I think I've already read it, but I'll read it again. Places of worship, places of worship may use their own discretion regarding face covering requirements. However, face coverings are strongly recommended for uh, uh, congregations during worship services, especially while singing or speaking together. Face coverings are also recommended for situations within places of worship where people from different households are unable to or unlikely to maintain a distance of six foot from each other. Yes, sir. I think G. I think G and H. I think the rest are uh, G. Effective communication. The requirements of wearing a face covering shall not apply when a person who is hearing impaired needs to see the mouth or someone wearing a face covering to communicate. It shall also not apply to persons speaking to a large group of people, where the face coverings may make it difficult for others to understand the speaker, providing the speaker can stay at least six foot away from other persons. And we have endured that in this body in the last three meetings. People were making reference to the council president by having a mask on when it was pretty much impossible to communicate in that manner. Correct. And actually, Mr. Kirby, we've been wearing masks when you showed up here in person anyway. I think everyone has adhered to that. H, indoor athletic facilities, all indoor athletic facilities, including fitness centers, commercial gyms and spas, as well as yoga, bar, and spin facilities shall comply with the state health uh, officer's June 30th, 2020 order. And any subsequent such order, patrons are not required to wear face coverings or masks while activities participating in uh, permitted athletic activities. However, employees in regular interaction with patrons are required to wear face coverings or masks. I believe that was verbatim from the Madison County as well. Private clubs and gatherings, other face coverings shall not be required in meetings of private clubs or private organizations provided. The meetings are not open to the general public and uh, they can keep a consistent six foot distance between persons from different households is maintained. I believe that is extra in this one and not in the Madison County. There's some more things that I think we ought to have exceptions for. Okay. For people with asthma, COPD, respiratory problems, and anxiety attacks. I think we'll yeah, we, yeah, we get to the end. It's Poyer. more specific in the back page. Where is it, Herman? We're getting to it, I think. Or, I think it was well, I, I, referenced in three. That's what I'm talking about is eating. 
it does not say, it just says mental or physical health. Well, but it says, or mass poses a greater mental or physical health, safety, or security risk, such as when a person is tr has trouble breathing, is unconscious, and incapacitated, or in unable to remove the face covering without assistance. Okay, a person so, that, that has asthma is not necessarily going to exhibit any sort of, uh, you, how do you know if they're having trouble breathing? Is unconscious, that's kind of obvious, incapacitated, or is unable to remove their face mask. I'm just saying to me that does not say uh, medical issues. And could, and but, could but, but before that it says a mass poses a, a greater mental or physical health such, issue. And then it does such as. Such as, and those are just examples. I don't think it's limited to that, but if well, you maybe have we a, should put such could, as could, asthma. Couldn't any possible person of the public claim to have that difficulty? Well, yep. Sure. So, so yeah. perhaps we should mention this How you gonna monitor as, that? as per identified by a doctor's note. Oh, so now you're going to require people to carry a doctor's note, not to wear If a mask. they want to be exempted from a mask ordinance. Oh, my goodness. Again, I would yield to the state health director on what he recommends, how that would be enforced, and I would have to talk to chief on how that the doctor, I, I don't know, I, I guess you know, people don't notice to skip school all the time. I don't know if they could do that as well. But I mean, that could be certainly a question we could ask uh, Dr. Harris um, or uh, the Madison County Health Officer. We could ask her how they are going to address that for guidance. I don't disagree with that. I'm amenable to that. Uh, four, children. Parents, guardians, and caregivers are responsible for ensuring the proper masking of children over the age of two years in other places. They must also ensure that face coverings or masks does not pose a choking hazard for children and can be safely worn without obstructing a child's ability to breathe. Any problem there? Mr. Art will make notation that the age that was Well, the you. next one is to me is a contradiction of, of the one up above when it says that discretion of children eight years old or younger shall exercise their own discretion. So to me, that's, that's very conflicting because you're telling the people that they should wear them, and then you said, well, but it's your discretion. And I think that's very I made a note of that, too. Okay, and I'll read it. It's a, uh, discretion of young children, parents, guardians, and caregivers of children eight years older or younger shall exercise their own discretion regarding the ability of those children to consistently and effectively wear a face mask covering or mask. And, I, and Irma, that would... I think probably if the child has a, 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 autism or something is that, and we addressed that last week, I don't, I don't disagree with that. Well, I think the caveat there is it's it's the parent or, or guardian discretion, and part of that discretion is whether or not that child even enters that facility. Well, again, and we can make it stated clear, but I would assume that the parent, if you're under the age of, I believe it's 16 in Alabama, they provide the care and are legally liable for your behavior. Um, and it goes, let's go back to what we just talked about. If there is a existing condition as asthma, autism, something like that, that would then of course follow into the parents because they are the caregiver and guardian of that child. To, I think they age 16 in my, or is it 15 in Alabama, it's different. But we can- Or if you get above a certain age, you can make sure they don't do it. What they're trying to do to make sure they yeah, and I think we could verify very easily what the state of Alabama code says on a child being out of that range. Uh, B, child care establishments and schools, all schools, daycares, and other children establishments shall develop their face coverings, policies, and procedures based on guidance and recommendations from public health authorities in the State Department of Education. These policies should weigh in the risk and benefits of masks to children, teachers, and other school employees. Parents and guardians should be notified to such policies and procedures. Where the consistent use of the face covering or mask is not possible due to the supervision of multiple children, the facility shall adhere to sanitary, hygienic, and face covering practices to the maximum extent uh, permissible. 
So, so this paragraph says that we are not going to tell any school what to do. That they're going to develop their own policies based upon health guidelines. Well, I don't think we have the authority to tell school what to do. But I, I'm just thing. I'm just asking yes or no. That's what we're saying. Yes, that's what you're yeah. saying. And Herman, I would think that this is addressed in, again, the Alabama State Code of uh, daycares and things like that. They have a standard that we don't mandate. That's a state and federal mandate. And let's ask that question, too, so we can be very specific. Okay, we'll ask for the state code and definitions of those. Anything with that? No. Uh, five, businesses unless otherwise ordered by the state health officer to comply with a stricter face covering requirement, business owners, managers, and supervisors shall develop their own policies and procedures regarding face coverings or masks for employees in accordance with the Centers for Disease Control and Alabama Department of Public Health guidance. Questions? Well, the reason for that is obvious. You've got a public contact service. There's additional requirements for the employees. I have not. I have not seen many businesses that aren't requiring their employees to wear masks. The vast majority I see are requiring it. And under the state health order, Herman, that is currently in and has been extended, I believe servers, if in a restaurant, the servers must wear a mask. But this is odd to me. The food preparation folks do not have to wear a mask. And I think their justification was it's not transferred via food, but really, I mean, that's a state question to, to get yeah, that kind of ironed out because that's above our authority. But um, we, we'll need to get that too. We'll need to spell that out. Uh, a, public places. If a business contains a space or spaces open to the general public, Policies regarding those spaces must comply with the restricted restrictions in Section 2 of this order. Questions? B, non-public places. If a business contains a space or spaces not open to the general public, a non-public place shall include in Section 2 of this order, such as an office or back room, policies regarding those spaces, spaces should take into account the health, safety, and comfort of the employees. Questions? C, employee safety. Employers are encouraged to uh, structure work uh, to promote social distancing and limits close contact as much as possible within workplaces where face coverings or masks may pose risk to personal safety. Questions? Six, notice all businesses and venues open to the general public shall not, shall, excuse me, shall post a notice at all public entrances of the establishment stating that face coverings are required inside the establishment. I believe that was exact wording from the Madison County. Any questions? Seven, uh, conflict. This order uh, incorporates by referencing the provisions of the governor's proclamation and state health officer's orders presently in place and as amended in the future, the intent is for this order to supplement those proclamation and orders, and that the more restrictive requirements govern if there is a conflict between this order and the state proclamations and orders. To the extent that this ordinance is in conflict with other ordinances of the city, this ordinance shall supersede the others until this ordinance is amended or repealed. Any questions? That's just a legal, I guess, paragraph right there. Is that to? Yeah, that's just to make sure that we, don't, if the state requires something more reasonable than we are, then of course the state regulations will apply. Okay, thank you. Any questions for that? And of course, I'm not going to. Basically, we only have the authority with the state grants. Eight, failure to comply with this ordinance is punishable by a fine of up to $500 and up to 30 days in jail at the discretion of the municipal judge. All court costs are hereby waived on the first offense. Okay, I'm sure there'll be discussion here. I thought that's what we were doing. I'm sorry? I, okay. I, uh, I'm asked for I discussion. Think, I think 30 days, I think jail time is ridiculous, and I think $500 is too high. I agree with both of those. I do as well. And so should we structure a 
step ladder approach to this? In other words, so much first offense, so much second offense? No. Uh, because it's like a parking ticket. You, if you get 30 of them, you still pay 30 okay. parking tickets. And, and what if you have somebody that has three or four offenses and has no intention of paying it? Can I ask a question to Chief Allen, since the judge isn't here? Chief, if you, at some point, the number of tickets or misdemeanors you would have would then show up on your record. And if you were to be pulled over for, let's say, a broken taillight, that would then show up that the state had, had the orders against you for whatever, if it, parking or whatever they may be. Is that correct? Yes, you can offend to appear. You want to take it on from the judge and get that. When the individual stops you, they ask you, they call back to the table and see if you want to get back to that person back here. And most times we're back when you say no. Well, let, let me alter direction on the chief, if I may, and it's really in line with your question, Paige. We've said this is pretty much like the smoking order. Do you know of any court cases or enforcements happening in your tenure here on the smoking ordinance? No. So basically people have seen the rules and generally complied for the most part. We had a rash of them when it was first passed. We hadn't had one. I, I, I prosecuted several years without having one after the initial ones came through. You know, I think too though, just like I said earlier, if you go into uh, an establishment and they ask you to leave, I can't see people most not, people will choose to leave. I, I can't see it? people not leaving, and if they, then if they don't leave, basically it boils down to a trespassing situation, does it not, Chief? Right. Okay. I mean, so I, I, you know, I'm not. I have no intent of doing this for the fines or the jail time. I, that's that's not it. it. It's about public safety. So if you know people don't want to comply and they leave and they won't leave, then. The store calls the police department, they remove them, and if they, you know, again, if they don't leave willingly, then they're basically trespassed. And, and that's the way I look at it. What, what is the penalty? Very simple. What is the penalty in the smoking ordinance? So, uh, it's $500 for 30 days. Fine. Uh, Herman, uh, to, uh, I'll give you my questions. We would, I would need to know from Judge Cook. At what point do misdemeanor tickets, et cetera, things like that, once they fail to pay those, at what point does that become a warrant that they would then, when the police ran your tag, it would make them aware you had a warrant, open warrant. So we need to confirm that with Judge Cook. Well, we, I, what, what, what we do is we get a ticket, especially if we get a time to pay it. If you don't pay it, we we'll take it off. And this says up to five hundred dollars. This doesn't say that this doesn't say the judge is going to get five hundred dollars. He might make it twenty five dollars. I'm just trying to address your your question, Charles. It's how many times can someone ignore the ticketed or yeah. the offense? And so you're saying we get a ticket. I think we have thirty days to pay a ticket, a speeding well, ticket. Okay, but so you're saying at the point of that date, your court date is if you breach that. Then at that point, they can actually issue a warrant for you that says you are in non-compliance. Okay. Now, let, let me share with you why we waive the court cost. Okay. Court cost is several hundred dollars. So, not make much sense to have a $25 fine. And have three hundred dollars. If you're trying to keep it to a minimum, have a uh, court cost to say So that's why that's what I'm going to try to suggest it to you. So you're saying by the time somebody gets a second offense, they're kind of proving that that doesn't serve as a deterrent. Right. It's on the first one. So yeah, second time, is you're on your own. Hope it wouldn't be a second time. But that, that was just a suggestion. That's something that the court cost you several hundred dollars. Most of that goes what I call south. And if I remember correctly, the normal littering fine is five, up to $500, and I rarely ever see it fined $500. That is correct, No, it was just to show that you don't always bring something down and you can't get the We don't like to pass, but that's up to y'all to decide. Nothing just to put it in there, but that's a standard type of penalty. I think you had the majority say that jail time was not even on the table, so we can strike that off that right now. Um, and I guess my question is, I would need to speak with Judge Cook to see um, 
It, what, because he has way more authority than we do because he's a judge in the state of Alabama. And his leisure, the judgment is his. And so he knows his restraints in any situation. He would have to tell me now that Madison County, which includes Huntsville and Madison City and all that, if he and other judges have spoken about this, if they're getting direction from the state uh, bar on what to do, uh, I would need him to answer that question for me. But I can I can call him for that. But just for the record, I will let y'all know the answer. Any other questions? I, I don't know that it fits here or anywhere else. I didn't see anywhere else that fits a better question. Are we talking only specifically in the city limits of Decatur? Because there are some rules that we do enforce out in the police jurisdiction. It can be enforced in the police jurisdiction, but I'm opposed to that. We, we chose to do it in the so, so we need to say in here somewhere specifically only in the city limits. Okay, I'll make it out of that. Any other discussion with eight? Nine, uh, if any subsection, sentence, clause, phrase, or word of this ordinance or any application of it to any person, structure, or circumstance is held to be invalid or unconstitutional, by a decision of a court of uh, competent jurisdiction, then such decision shall not affect the, the validity of the remaining portions of the applications of this ordinance. Herman, why don't you explain that in name of Mr. Horse? So it does not cancel the entirety of the ordinance. It does not cancel the entirety of the no, ordinance. No, that's right. The purpose of it is if it's a part of it for some reason it's invalid, it does not invalidate the rest of the ordinance. Any questions or concerns with that? Section 2, duration. This ordinance and order shall go into effect on Friday, July 3rd, 2020, which will need to be changed at 5 p.m., and that is questionable and remain in full force and effect until Alabama Department of Public Health and Morgan County Health Department officer gives guidance that public health conditions in the county warrant a dis discontinu discontinuation uh, or, or change of this order. Um, I, I still think we should do it for 30 days only and per perhaps be forced to renew it for another 30 days if it's necessary. I'm flexible, but there has to be a time frame on it, in my opinion, and it has to be um, validated with uh, the correct authority doctors and, and our health care facility and the state health director, of course, I would think would be important with that. But I'm with you. I think a, a limit must be put in here. Billy, what's your thoughts? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in agreement with that. I don't have a problem with that at all. And I believe your recommendation is that every two weeks we, we come back and look at it? Well, 30 days is probably okay, 30 days. good enough for me. So you know, that's your I think it's the intention of like here, if the pandemic's declared to be over and state emergency's gone, I think we can then this needs to be gone. Point. Yeah. Okay, so any other comments on that right there? Dr. This day, it would be July now, we have to do that. All right, I'll go back and what we have to discuss more at length. I have face coverings required in public places, A, indoor spaces or businesses or venues open to the general public, including but not limited to stores, bars, restaurants, C, exception 3B, entertainment venues, public meeting spaces, city government buildings, civic centers, et cetera. Mr. R, I believe you uh, were the thought you were only in favor of government buildings. Yeah, me too. Okay, Mr. R, did you? Yes. I didn't hear you. Okay, and then Ms. Hill. Mr. Jackson, I'm good with it like it stands. Okay. My thought process is people are coming to government buildings pretty much because they have to. They're going to have to go to grocery stores. They're not forced to go to restaurants, not forced to go to places of entertainment. So if you're going to have the public gathering, we're trying to ensure the health and safety of the public, don't we need to ensure it? Again, with certain restrictions, like I said, with churches, well, not, that's a choice to be there. You're not forced to be there. You're going to be forced to go to the grocery store to shop and get food. I agree with that, but I think, too, that people can go years without being in a government building. I mean, but 
And so I, well, I'm I just that, assuming that yeah. once a year somebody has to pay their taxes or something. I mean, we do, they do it online, people go for them. So, I mean, I think that that is not really going to impact and push back the virus if we only limit it to government buildings. That, that's kind of where I'm leading. Stacy, question. I know the county has deferred all mailing fees that they would implement due to the COVID while the governor's order stands. Have we done that at the city level? So we probably are, take council action, I would imagine. Yeah. So we can kind of mirror that as far as taking those fees away right now for the COVID. That, that may be something, Herman, that we may need to consider. And if that. If no, what was that again? I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, over at the county, I know you can off your tag usually there's a fee associated with that they have waived all mailing fees uh, i didn't know if we had done that on the sea level definitely we have not we may need to look into that to be fair which allows people to do it remotely instead Correct. of visiting there's no need to yeah. be here in person so that is a question uh any other questions on that and for me whether it passes or not i think we come back let's say it does not pass but we then come back and look at the city government buildings Specifically, I think that is our under our authority to do that, and I think that would be uh, something we have to do separate if it doesn't pass. Uh, anything else on that? I just think that this, you know, it's already been proven that uh, statewide we're allowed to do it outside of uh, the government building scope. Yes, sir. Not uh, C. Outdoor areas open to the general public where ten or more persons are gathered and unable to maintain a distance of six or more feet between persons. From the same household, um, I believe there's some questions there. The last time we passed over this, we seem to be hung up and unsure where to go. Children on a playground, kids at the ballpark. And, and I did ask for guidance on what those boards have implemented. Are we going to look? I'm not for, even sure. Do you yeah. say we're going to look for guidance from the health department people on that? Yes, and those boards, I think. Are we even having organized ball right now, goose girl softball, baseball? I know that was postponed. I don't even know. I've not heard from Jason if that is even. So softball is in. Okay. Uh, for the city of Decatur? Okay. All right. Uh, we will need to get with uh, her and that last Jason when that started what that uh, schedule is. Any other questions on that? We'll get those answered and back to the council and to the public. Uh, B, of three exceptions. Uh, eating or drinking persons may remove face coverings while eating or drinking, provided that they recover their faces when interacting with other persons, not at their tables, such as bartender servers or other customers. I have that notated too. Did, did someone else have a question with that one? That's, that's where I had presented a question that I, I think you're entering an establishment that you're making a choice to do something that isn't ordinarily necessary. And, and if somebody's entering a restaurant, I, I don't really see them putting their face mask on and off every five minutes. I really don't see it happening. Okay, so what do you propose there? I, I would say a, a, a place uh, of to eat and drink. Maybe if you're eating, you, you have to have your mask on. Yeah. Actually, they are making lots of little holes in them, but um, I, I, I don't know. I'm just wondering what your thought is. People have to have the mask off, off to consume. Mm -hmm. Whatever they're consuming, they have to have it off to consume. So I think that those places should be exempted. Again, I think that most people are like me. I've only gone out to eat twice since the thing began. I, I avoid those places to avoid the infection. Herman, can we get more direction on what Madison County and Scott Harris, their explanation of this and what they are recommending for restaurants and bars, et cetera? Uh, and I haven't seen a place serving food that every worker didn't have a mask on. I haven't seen it yet. I mean, this is the people, this is the customer. Right. Uh, well, yes, we, we'll look and see, but the reasoning is you can't eat the mask. And so therefore, I don't think it's reasonable in between eating to have the mask on. I think that's unreasonable. So are you saying that B should be uh, exempted? 
restaurants should be exempted if you're eating or consuming a beverage? In my opinion. Okay. What, let me ask, I'm just asking. Okay. If you wear it again, you sit down, take it off, when you leave, you put it back on. That's why I've seen it somewhere. And that way you don't have to take it off at all. Except when you get it where you sit. And that sounds reasonable, and that's what I've done. You may take your mask off when you enter. You must put it back on when you leave. Does anybody else have any comment well, on that? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. But if you, you see a friend over here, you go over there, you, they don't have on a mask, you don't have on your mask. That's what this is trying to cover. That's what it's saying is if you're interacting with somebody, it's not a true thing. In a, in a non-consumption mode. And then you might not have to put it back on when you leave, Charles, you're because you're not going to be in open air and it's not going to be necessarily that situation. And I guess my concern would be at bars when you're not necessarily eating things since we have changed that percentage rate, they may just be consuming an alcoholic beverage and congregating. Uh, if they can't keep the six feet difference, would they then require a mask? I think there's two different issues there, the just drinking and talking than eating. So do we just need to clean the language up? That's what I would recommend that you be very specific in what you're talking and what you're wanting with this uh, theme. Well, so. We'll have to share with us what your vision is. All right, if you're sitting there in the bar, what, what, what is your vision as to what should be done? Well, my vision is I don't intend to be there until this but virus I, I, is I, gone. No, I'm talking about uh, if you can't maintain six feet separation, what, what are y'all's vision? What do you suggest for way of language? Let's do it that way. Any thoughts, Chuck? Why can't you maintain six feet? I said you could. I'm saying, why could you? Well, I don't know. I mean, in some of the places that I've, I've seen, they have taken their tables in the bar and put them well, strategically they're, placed. They're so, I mean, I don't know why they could not keep people well, in the establishment now outside of different issues. But Chuck, you can also say that people go to those places to congregate and be close together. Well, I'm just trying to get suggestions. Can you say so long as they maintain a six foot separation? I'm good with that. I'm good with that. I think my issue with this is that is a state health order. Uh, if the state wants to implement that, that rule, the six foot, I think that is then putting a burden on our restaurant owners, bar owners, uh, establishment owners. It's already there. Yes, and so we certainly don't want them to interact with someone who's not going to be uh, civil or interact in a negative way. I'm sure all of y'all have seen on Facebook some of the reactions at some places. I think that is then putting the owners of that businesses and the chief is gone, I think, but he and I spoke of that. And we have existing laws that that owner could then call 911, and that's why you have the police to then take care of that situation and not put that business owner in that position. I, don't, I, I think there's some question there. If the state's going to mandate that, then the state needs to police that. And I don't know that I haven't seen anyone from the state policing that anywhere. So I guess my question is I don't want to put anything extra on the business owner. I don't think that's fair and could escalate to something more problematic, uh, problematic or severe than the mask wearing itself. And, and I'm uh, the chief and I had spoke of that in great detail and how do you, um, I think what we come up with is you let the business owner know that is what the police are here for. Call 911, they will be there. They will have your back to then do that for you because the state of Alabama is mandating it. But does the state health department not inspect? Well, that's a very good question, uh, Charles. And I did ask our director of the, the county health department um, as far as there are certain things the health department will mandate and order and then take care of, and then there, I believe, the occupancy rule of 50%, that is up to the local police departments. And that was news. So they're down. delegating it down. They are, but I think we need to be specific on what is our local police department's obligation and what is the health department's because we don't have authority over the health department. But we do have authority over the police department. There are two different uh, things they are in charge of. And so well, I would ask them to make that public too. Help me understand what, what are we saying about? No, I, I'm just using the suggestion of, of where you want to wear a mask. There are already 
required to have six foot separation. And that's required for business required. Well, that's Well, I guess that's my well, question. It's going to likely be starting out with business. They've got somebody that won't comply with that guideline, then they won't have to call the police. We don't expect them to go in and enforce uh, the law. They just need to. I'm talking about as far as uh, if somebody said, I'm not going to do that. And I would just like clarity from the state, since the state are the ones with way more authority than we, that they have already put this order in place. Who is enforcing it? Who are they expecting to enforce it? And I think our business owners need to know that. And I think our chief and our police need to know that too. Where is our line? Where is health department line? And what is the state of Alabama expecting of the city of Decatur and who to man that? But I, I really don't think that the state of Alabama is expecting anything because what they actually said in the press conference was that each community could set up the guidelines as they saw fit. Uh, so I don't know that they're, the expectations are, are there, Herman, as far as us enforcing that. I, I, that's just, I, don't, I don't see the expectations coming back to us uh, to enforce that, do you? Well, I'm, I'm talking about the state, the modified state of your code, uh, state of your code, which is required to have six to comply with that. And I think that's we go back to the very beginning where we expect the businesses to comply to help us with this situation throughout the entire process, I mean the entire ordinance. So would we all be comfortable, say on B, where it says eating or drinking, persons may remove face coverings, just eliminate the rest of it as long as they can maintain proper social distancing? And I would say we would refer to the state, stay and have an order or whatever it has But the state is the ones that's established the social distancing. I know, but if the state has establish that role, they need to be specific with us as a city and also the business owners on who mandates that. Business owners don't need to be in limbo on who do they call. Okay. Do they call the So are you going to get that answer? Department, they call the police department. So are we going to get that answer from and, state people? And I agree with you, really. I don't think the state has any intentions of doing it. I think they're putting it off on municipalities and they're giving a, a kind of a conflicting message. You see the president, the governor saying, listen to your local authorities, and then people saying you don't have the right to do it, but obviously they get into it. So I don't disagree with you, but I would really like to hear the state's answer. That would be good to hear that. Look, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, is, I mean, you guys might not agree with, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory. It's the same one that we find in nearly every ordinance that we read. Uh, you took it from other ordinances that you looked at, and I think we find this in nearly every, uh, verbatim, in nearly every ordinance that we uh, read. It, it, this is it, exactly. It's not, I mean, it's identical. It's not, so if we do something different, I mean, that's, that's, Fine and well, uh, fine and good, but well, the, the, the thing is, is that we're not going to be sitting on an island by ourselves if we do this. Well, it's like what's full in Madison, Mayor Bowers said, that this whole region, is more uniform we can have the rules, the easier it is for people to know what's expected. And that makes sense, though. Yeah, that makes sense, because if you travel from one municipality so to, the, to the next. If you travel a bunch more, bunch more travel to, you know, Madison, yeah. That makes sense, though. And I would concur with him, and I would think the board that we have in place for Morgan County should then talk with Madison County and also Huntsville Hospital, who owns the hospital that's in the city, of, both hospitals in the city of Decatur, that they get a combined effort and tell North Alabama what is best for the hospital. Uh, they are the sole owners of those hospitals. So that's going to be my recommendation for me. But uh, then I have. Um, I believe there were some questions about the two-year-old, but I, did we really, did we get to any um, type of uh, decision on that? Again, I think Section four. Mm -hmm. And did we want to be more direct with A for section four, uh, discretion for young children, parents, guardians, and caregivers of the children eight years or older? Uh, shall exercise their own discretion regarding the ability of those children to consistently and effectively wear a mask covering or mask. Um, again, we're going to get that age at what point a child becomes an adult in the state of Alabama. 
that looks to be another one where the health departments and other communities are all pretty much united on that and, number two. And the verbiage is almost identical from uh, 2A and 4A. I think it's almost identical in uh, the ordinances that we read from other cities. So consistency is there. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, you know, for us to try to doctor it a different way just, I mean, puts us in a in a, in a, on an island by ourselves, and I think that uh, other communities are doing exactly this. Anything else? Okay, and then I have um, number eight under section five, eight failure to comply with this ordinance, it, the, the fine and or jail time. I think we've taken jail time completely off the table. And then we will, though, be mandated, and that is under the AG opinion that we as the city have to make that fine public or that would be that's individualized with these uh, penalties. You, you skipped over the argument I, I think it's okay to, uh, we can put like asthma seals, or we can just say respiratory illness. Uh, I believe it's covered, but we can make more decisions. I agree with you. Just be more specific. So that's fine. Don't make any more deals. I agree with you. I don't have a problem with that. I'm sorry. So what are you going to put in there? Respiratory ailments? Yes. I would like to put rest ailments such as respiratory. Yes. That's fine. I, I, just, we, we don't, I didn't. Yes. Chuck, I apologize. I didn't hear you speak up. If, that's why I asked. Did oh. I miss you? Or, I know. No. Uh, eight, fair to clap again, the fine. So we need to discuss that. But I think, and I'll go back to this one more time. I think if we, if it gets into that situation where police have to be called to an establishment, it's going to turn into something else anyway. It's going to turn into a trespassing charge, and so this is almost not going to be in play. This will be a minor portion. I mean, it's, it's not even going to be a portion of it because when they're asked to leave and they don't leave, then they become trespassers, and if the police remove them on a trespassing warrant, then it becomes a different charge other than this. So, I mean, again, I don't have a, a problem necessarily with leaving it up to $500. I don't ever want to inflict a five hundred dollar uh, fine on anybody for doing this. Definitely don't want to see jail time associated with this. But I do think that this is one of those things that's going to work itself out. Am I wrong? I mean, tell me why I'm wrong, Herman. Just the judge to make, uh, that's, I, that's what my question. Would if we put specifically in here what a fine would be? Would that limit Judge Cook to what he could? So. If we leave it up to 500, it would be at Judge Cook's discretion. He could do it for a dollar or nothing. He could. Yeah, if he chose to. If we have a limit we don't want to exceed, we would need to put that in this order so hey, Judge Cook would not have the authority hey, to, yeah. So I, I not I, that I think he would. No, I don't have a problem with this. I'm okay. just saying I don't think it's ever going to, I think it's going to turn into something else if they. As the chief said order. earlier, he can't remember one of the smoky orders since he's been here. Yeah, but uh, Chip's been here since. He's been, been here long. 2000, what, seven? No, no, 97. No, 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 no. The smoking ordinance. Well, oh, we, smoking you, ordinance. No, when you said that, when Oh, you yeah, said we hadn't had, recall, after the first year, we didn't have any. Smoking ordinance, so right. that was back in 2007. So. Right. Okay. Well, I would like to remove the 30 days in jail. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I, I think agree. everybody agrees with that. I agree with that. Uh, and that is the last thing I have a uh, note of that someone we need to come back and discuss. Have I missed anything? Ms. Hill, do you have anything that I've missed? No, ma'am. Anyone else on council? No. I think we're going to need some direction uh, as far as a, a thought on do we need to convene at a later date. We do need to give our, the appropriate time for a meeting to then have all this cleaned up and everything that we've put in to come to us. Then I'm going to yield that to the council. I think we have put this thing off. I think that everything that we have discussed uh, can be, Herman, I'm going to try putting anything on the legal department, but I think that everything that we've discussed can be pretty much um, clarified and, and, and cleared up by tomorrow. I don't know whether we get communication with the outside. Because all we're talking about basically here is verbiage in, in most uh, instances, are we not? I know she wanted you to have some communication with. Uh, and I can call Judge Cook. I mean, I can make Dr. that Dr. Harris or, or somebody else. But I would like to at least see a document in place by tomorrow because I, I do think that if we um, and, and set a meeting for tomorrow, set a meeting for Wednesday. Uh, because I think, uh, as I said last week, the sooner we do this, uh, in my opinion, the more likely we are to save uh, people from illness and even death. 
And uh, if we do it tomorrow, I don't think that we would get unanimous consent for immediate consideration. But if we do it on Wednesday, uh, I think that it's introduced tomorrow, then we have an opportunity to at least vote on it. I'm just saying, yeah, introduce it for it to be introduced oh, okay. so that we can do a, a vote on it on Wednesday. Uh, that's so I need a direction. Do, does anyone want to do a meeting tomorrow night or do you want to wait till Wednesday? I just need some direction on when council can make that meeting. And I think we have the document ready for tomorrow. And uh, do a meeting, uh, introduce the meeting for Wednesday because we're not going to get immediate consideration at five or whatever time you choose to. And then we have a vote on it and it either goes up or down. Am I, when I, where am I wrong with that, Herman? Well, look at your door. You know, we'll have some yeah. But I think we've already hammered out what the changes we want. I think that's been hammered out. So all you're doing is basically tra uh, transcribing that, putting that on, on paper, and, and so that we can look at it, make sure that's exactly what we want, and then uh, the vote comes after that. And I've, I've made notes, Herman. I'll get with you tomorrow. I, I can get you these notes where yeah, the changes have taken place. Yes, I agree. You can turn it around with the back. The only. We need to make sure that we've got all of them. The only question I have, Mr. Jackson, and I know that Tuscaloosa made theirs very quickly. They didn't. I was wrong. Her, uh, Chip was right. Okay, so I it has wrong. to be advertised. So well, it, it says as soon as published. Okay, it becomes law as soon as published. Yeah. Okay. As soon as, as, soon as published. So it will require a vote from council to proceed. It will have to be published. Is that correct? Right. All ordinances do that. They, yeah, when y'all exactly, pass them, it, it doesn't be effective. Normally until they sit for two meetings. No, no, no. You would have to you would have to publish what we have together our changes. No sir, no matter. No matter. It has to be the change document that the council's talked about tonight, not this existing one. Uh, you don't have to publish it in the newspaper. All you gotta do is introduce it, make sure it's what you want, then you, you vote on it. What you voted on it, it goes to the mayor's office for him to review. Once he signs it, then we send it to the Decatur Daily and it's published. No. No. What you're talking about is the zoning ordinance. And I understand. Just don't get those. Okay. So it does not require to be pre printed in the paper? No, ma'am. Okay. No. No. I, I appreciate you sharing. And then by general uh, rule of uh, this municipality, I believe the mayor has up to 10 days to sign that or not sign it and get it back to the city clerk. So it has to be signed. If he doesn't sign it for 10 days, it would negate it being effective until after that signature, right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, well, you know, basically, it has, what y'all have adopted That could potentially be a 17 days. I'm sorry, I'm not taking questions. 17 days before anything is even considered. Is that correct? Because well, you have the 10 days that. Again on, uh, June the 20th. He would have to sign it first. I'm sorry, July the 20th. July the 20th. Okay, let's go back to Mr. Jackson's uh, thought on Wednesday. Do we, we need a time for everyone to make that? Wednesday, Mr. Jackson? Okay. I, unless there's some way to do it sooner than that. I mean, and I don't see that any way to do it sooner than Wednesday. I would be very shocked if the state does not issue one uh, 
from the health from Dr. Harris due to this in Madison County. They are one of the largest providers mm -hmm. in the state of healthcare. So I would be very shocked if that does not happen before we can convene again. But um, Council, Mr. Jackson has proposed Wednesday. We talk in the afternoon. Uh, you tell us, and we will try to get three people there at least, or four people, or five people, whatever. Chuck, what's do. best for you? Uh, Mr. Jackson, do you have a time frame? I'll make it. Uh -huh. I think this is important. We'll, we'll still have the I got you. Mr. Kirby, do you have a time on Wednesday that is better? I'll try to make it any time, but afternoon is better. Afternoon? Afternoon. Ms. Hill, do you have a time on Wednesday that is better for you? Afternoon or evening is fine. Okay. I will make my schedule. Mr. R? Afternoon. Afternoon. Stacy. What about 4 o'clock, please? I'm good. No, like I said, I'll good. work on whatever we're good. Ms. Hill? Sure. Perfect. Uh, Herman, if you will get these changes, I'll give you what I've notated these changes. You can do that, and you can send it to the council to make sure everything is in line with what we've talked about this evening and before the Wednesday meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Uh, we are going to, we have in three minutes, going into our pre-work session. So we will have a couple of minutes if you need your other rest of the time.
ice would be treated just like a smoking. Not a problem. Right. 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 If someone were to walk into a Walmart smoking, they're going to ask them to stop smoking, man. Bane, and if they don't, then they're going to call the police to make them aware that someone is violating their policy and the city's policy, and this police will show them to take care of it like that. So I think that's pretty much how this is going to take place. For our I don't expect and don't have a desire for our police to try to monitor this. When our letter gets done, you can put it here. Yeah. You're, supposed to, How are you? you're supposed to sit with the yeah. yellow dots, but you can sit right here since we got a talk. And I have not sent you an email. I'll because, have my mask on until uh, I start. I have been wrapped up. And then I started, I, when I was researching some other stuff, it's like every time I go in, you know, I don't agree with that. With, um, gosh, um, Ms. McConnell, uh, on, on, uh, hardly, uh, I hardly agree with them on anything. But when Mitch McConnell says this is our best option, but, um, well, I can address you know, it. We are not going to entertain that right until after the hearing. It, it's on hard the other to believe that, that um, people uh, who are even opposed to it do not believe that Mitch McConnell has the very best the, information uh, that any of us could possibly have. Well, and he said that, that that you know this is our very best option. And he said uh, until we get okay. a vaccine, and he said short of a ventilator. You know, we don't really have a whole lot. You know, this is less complicated than a ventilator, is what he said. So, I mean, again, that's not the the uh, the person that I'm citing. I'm just simply saying that he's got a whole lot more information than any of us could ever uh, acquire. So. I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, to interrupt you. We are at 5:31. I'm ready to go. So our our pre-meeting is now starting. I have not sent it. Ms. I Hill, sent are you on the line? Okay. I'm sorry, sir. We're starting a free meeting. We're starting a free meeting. I'm sorry. Thank you. Ms. Hill, are you on the line? Okay, she can get on there. Okay, this is the pre meeting for the 6 o'clock agenda. Uh, we have District 1 weed abatements. Shall I go through these individually? Not now. Okay. Uh, would you like me to just go through the addresses or just. Not now. You don't have to go through them at all. I've, I've gone by a real so, Mr. Jackson is saying, uh, asking that we not go through these. Is that okay with other council members? Not now. Not now. Okay. Uh, at During the meeting. meeting. At the meeting, yes, sir. Okay. Then we will proceed on to the next, which is public hearings, set public hearings. Resolution 2153, abatement of unsafe conditions at 220 5th Avenue Northwest. Set public hearing for August 3rd, 2020 at 6 p.m. Mr. Lee, any changes? No changes, Ms. Bibby. Thank any, you. Any questions from Council? Thank you. Resolutions 2145, abatement of unsafe conditions at 821 7th Avenue Southeast. Set public hearing for August 3rd, 6 p.m. Mr. Lee, any changes? No changes. Questions from Council? Ordinance number 204413, rezoning request 1354-20. Set public hearing to be held on August 3rd, 2020 at 6 p.m. Uh, planning department, any changes? No, ma'am, no changes. Thank you, Matt. Any questions from council? Ordinance number 204414, rezoning request 1355-20, set public hearing to be held on August 3rd, 2020 at 6 p.m. Planning, Matt, any changes? No changes. Any questions from council? Ordinance number 24416, re rezoning request 1357 20, set public hearing to be held on August 3rd, 2020 at 6 p.m. Matt, any changes? No changes. Questions from Council? Thank you, Matt. Uh, public hearings for the evening resolution 2155, a approved request for a restaurant retail liquor license for Sal. Is that in here? Uh, if he can help me with a Mexican Grill LLC at 1826 Avenue Southeast, Unit N, Decatur, Alabama, 35601. And I believe this is a new request. There was a business there, a restaurant before, but did not serve alcohol. Any other questions? Resolutions for this evening. Approved request by T-Mobile for a 180-day extension for the modification of equipment on the existing mono Pine Tower located at 1406 Chadwell Street, Southwest Decatur. Any changes to that? No. Any questions from Council? Thanks, sir. 
None. Resolution is 2156, approval of 2019 community development caper or HUD. Alan, any changes? No, ma'am. Any questions from uh, council? Resolution 2157, assess demolition cost in the amount of $4,494 against 1039 East Bolton Street Southeast. Mr. Lee. No change. Any questions from council? Resolution 2158, assess demolition cost in the amount of $4,180 against 1612 Chestnut Street Southeast. Mr. Allen, Mr. Lee. No changes. Any questions from council? Resolution number 2159, assess demolition cost in the amount of 10885 against 1819 Corinne Avenue Southwest. Mr. Lee? No changes. Council questions? Resolution number 2160, approve MOU between the Juvenile Probation Office and DYS for transportation. Uh, legal. Uh, there's no change from last week. It's just as much as it was. Council, did you get all your questions resolved for this? Okay. Thank you, Herman. Resolution 2161, approve a budget adjustment to transfer funds between SES expense account. John? No changes. Any questions from Council? Resolution 2162, approve vacation request 519-20. Planning. No changes. Any questions from council? Resolution 2163, approved vacation request 520-20. Planning. No changes. Any hey, Matt, Any Matt, remind me where those are. Yes, again. sir. Remind me where those are again. This, um, do you want both of them? Well, one of them was, uh, was the um, uh, Seville, was it not? Correct. That? The one that right now, 520-20, 421 Catalina Place in the Seville. Seville, okay. And the other one was, where was that? I'm, I'm just trying to get a bearing on that. No, that's all right. 500 McCartney, McCartney Street. McCartney Street. That's exactly right. Thank you. I went over and looked at that. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Thank you, Matt. Uh, resolution 2164, approved parks and recreation organizational restructure. Either uh, Mr. Lake or Ms. Salen. Anyone from HR or Mr. Lake from Parks and Rec? This is Tab. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, so there were two meeting invites sent out, one for the 4 o'clock special meeting, <clears throat> one for the 5.30 meeting. Jason and Rochelle are parked on the, uh, the 5.30 meeting. I've tried to send them a text, but I suspect that they're on the meeting via their phone. Let's see. Someone may have just uh, made their way in. Okay. So it's 5.38. Uh, we started at 5.31. Well, I'm saying that there were two invites, the, so they're not connected on this call. Okay, did uh, either Mr. Lake or Ms. Sandlin connect? That's fine, we'll ask for the meeting. Uh, let's, let's go to the next. Uh, resolution 2165, emergency sirens upgrade in the amount not to exceed $70,000. Funding source, the general unfunded balance. Um, Chief, are you on the line? Oh, there you are, I'm sorry. <laughs> you snuck in, any, any changes on that? No, ma'am. Any other questions from the council? Thank you, Chief. Page, Council President. Now, yes. um, so I just received a uh, text from uh, Rochelle regarding the Parks and Rec org, and there are no changes. Great, thank you. Uh, resolution number 2168, designate city clerk to perform mayor's election duties pursuant to Code of Alabama 1975, section 11-4636. Stacy. Yes,
Okay. Any questions from council? Say that again, Stacy. Yes. In the Code of Alabama, and it's 1146, 36, that as the mayor is a candidate, it disqualifies him from being the election manager. Oh, okay. Sorry with the Yeah, that Stacy, uh, 114637 is the one that designates, designates him as that, yes. And so they yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Chief, uh, could, it, is, it is loud. If y'all could ask, if you could ask them to. Thank you. Uh, ordinance number 204399, Model Airplane Club Lease at Landfill. Uh, the first reading was held on 31620. Uh, Wanda, are you on the line? Legal, uh, Herman, I'm assuming nothing Yeah, that, that, that's no, there's no change in it from uh, last week or even uh, before that, but it's getting close to the time for it to renew now, so we think it's essential that you consider this and get it uh, approved so we can uh, finish up the lease agreement. Any questions from council? Get it council? signed, in other words, yeah. Any questions from council? Boards and committees reappoint Ms. Barbara Kelly, Historic Preservation Commission, term ending 319-2023. Questions? And the appeals hearing, first response ambulance service. I do know you outside there, attorney here. Good to have you. We'll have you at the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Uh, yeah. uh, I understand that they have legal counsel here that's quite expensive. Is there any way to take that first? That is up to counsel. It doesn't bother me at all. I, I don't have a problem with it. Ms. Jarrett, do you have a problem with it going first? I don't have a problem. I don't either. Ms. Hill, do you have a problem with uh, first response attorney going first? No, no, ma'am. Perfect. Then we'll put you at the very first. You're welcome. Hey, uh -huh. For housekeeping, I think probably the first run through with these, uh, I would give the procedural history of how we got to this point. Then they would put on the reason for their appeal and their argument, and then we would have a chance to respond. Okay, so. I will let you then uh, respond to that. I'll come to you for a explanation. Is that sure, okay? right. Where we would normally, because excuse me, present it, yeah. then I'll just do a brief summary of how we got here. Because you will be responding on behalf of the city, is that correct? correct. And uh, our, our, our lieutenant, where are we now? Are we What's Chief. Chief. Chief, look at that. Okay. Or, and, and Chief England as well. Do you know if uh, 911 will be here to be represented? She's okay. here, but oh. I. How you doing, Ms. Ferris? I'm sorry. It's been in and out with the. Thanks. Very good. 911. Do we need anyone else to be here that needs to be contacted that council be aware of? That Not that I'm aware matter? of. Perfect. Uh, that is all I have. We will convene at 6 o'clock on the dot. So thank you very much. Yes, ma'am.
I have never itched like this before. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. Okay. All right. Six o'clock. Mr. Kirby will be saying our invocation and our pledge this evening, Mr. Kirby. As we bow our head to pray for guidance, I'd like to mention Gail Green, Assistant Chief of Police of Phoenix City, passed away on the 24th due to the COVID virus. 33-year veteran of the department. This pandemic affects us all eventually. We ask for guidance, we ask for forgiveness for things that we failed to do and the times we have failed to have courage. In your name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Kirby. Roll call, please. Present. Here. Here. Hill. Here. Kirby. Here. All right, and I will go ahead and read this and we'll get a vote on this. Agenda items will be acted upon if they meet the guidelines necessary to perform essential minimum functions of the governmental body or a matter of necessity to respond to COVID-19. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Ard, second by Mrs. Hill. Discussion? I just simply say that um, I will uh, support this because, uh, as we said, they'll be voted on if they are deemed to be essential. Uh, many of these I don't deem to be essential, so I will be abstaining on those particular items. And, and I'll, I'm going to follow, I'm going to support everything because, or, or most of the things that are appropriate to support because we actually have a quorum here. So it's a little bit confusing that we're holding a vote that all this is necessary. We have a quorum to conduct business. Okay, uh, motion by Mr. Ard, a second by Mrs. Hill. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Gibby. Aye. Ard. Aye. Jackson. Aye. Hill. Aye. Kirby. Aye. That passes five to zero. Uh, before we get to weed of evidence, Mr. Uh, Ard, did you have a request? Did I put have a request. Oh, the request is is that uh, uh, we would request that uh, those of you in the chamber tonight, if possible, please wear a mask. Thank you. If not, I'm assuming six foot distancing. Yes. And I do have one, just for the record. It's just you need to hear what I say. Uh, we are going to go to the very last uh, item on the agenda: the appeals hearing for first response ambulance service. And I'm sorry, I know we've met. I cannot remember your name. That was hard. All right. You may come to the microphone. Will you be the only one presenting tonight from first response? I'll be presenting from first response. Perfect. Now, my understanding before we began is that Chip was going to... We will. I'll let you come up and let Chip then explain how we sure. got here, and then you will be responding for the city. Yes, right? ma'am. Okay. Yeah. No, you're first. first. I mean, I'm sorry. You're a last name. Hargett. H-A-R-G-E-T-T. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, Council, um, just uh, background, since this is the first time we've had uh, one of these appeal hearings. On August 19th of last year, uh, you passed an ordinance, the new ambulance ordinance, uh, which was effective 30 days after it ran in the newspaper. It ran in the newspaper on August 22nd, uh, so the effective date was 922. Uh, the first quarter that was impacted then was the fourth quarter of 2019. Um, the, uh, at that time, the, uh, the EMS, uh, not chairperson, yeah, uh, the, uh, the EMS uh, coordinator uh, notified uh, the uh, first response that in the fourth quarter of last year in the PJ, 
uh, they, on 82 calls, uh, 70 were on time. The ordinance requires 90% to be on time. Uh, 70 out of 82 turns out to be 85.4%. Uh, uh, in response to that, uh, there was a notice sent to uh, first response uh, that the MS coordinator was uh, imposing a $10,000 financial penalty in 10 points. Uh, first response pursuant to the ordinance uh, notified uh, the uh, ARB that they or notified the EMS coordinator that they were appealing that. The ARB meeting, which was scheduled the second uh, February, second Tuesday of February, was moved to uh, February 25th. At that time, following a hearing, uh, the uh, penalties, both time, uh, both points and uh, financial penalties uh, were upheld. Um, the arguments uh, basically from the city at that were that the ordinance has not changed uh, since from the old ordinance, the mechanism in was in place to change the time. Uh, first response argued, and this is it, because there's not a transcript, this is just to let y'all know what the issues were at that time. They argued uh, that there should be turnout time, that they wanted more time to talk about issues with the CAD system. Uh, they talked about other cities and the time standards they imposed, said that until the sus system is perfected, they can't be held responsible uh, for uh, slow times. Uh, said they had made the decision to concentrate on the sea limits rather than the PJ because of the cost benefit analysis. They talked about Dallas, Texas taking 30 minutes. And they also said uh, that only 12 calls uh, would have made the difference in that quarter had they made their times on that and that that was uh, it was not reasonable then to make that uh, penalty. They said they employ system status management uh, plans which is a distribution of assets around the city. Uh, the city countered uh, through Chief England that uh, all three of their stations are, are internal in the city close together none outside the belt line. Um, the, let me see where number nine is. Just a minute. I changed the order on my way in here. Um, uh, the ARB upheld the financial penalty and the point uh, penalty unanimously. Only the financial penalty may be appealed to the council. That's why uh, the points are not being uh, considered tonight. Uh, the appeal was set for March, for the March evening council meeting that was reset at first response's request uh, pursuant to the coronavirus. Uh, we reset uh, the uh, appeal till June and uh, they, they requested that we can uh, reset it until tonight, which was what was done. Following the decision by the ARB, uh, what I, I guess could be taken as a motion to reconsider, uh, Mr. Childers said that uh, the city had never notified them that the ordinance went into effect. Um, and he argued uh, section 3.7, 3-7 for that, uh, that, that it was required, but uh, that is for when the uh, EMS coordinator or the chief makes a change in regulations that it, it does not impact uh, the effective date of the ordinance. So that was not overturned. So uh, what I would anticipate tonight is following their uh, presentation and our response, uh, it would go to the council to make a decision. Uh, it's not written in the ordinance how this would actually happen. My recommendation, because it seems easier and more logical, would be that the first thing that would be taken would be a motion to uphold the the financial penalty is set. Motion and second, if that is voted down, then the next logical one to consider would be the motion, a motion to overturn, because that's easier than the than the last one. Same uh, motion and second, if that passes, that's the end of it, and it's set aside. Uh, if neither one of those passes, uh, somebody would need to make a motion to modify the decision which would presumably be 
a change in the amount of money and y'all would have to discuss the amount of money and then there would be a motion for that particular amount uh, which would be voted on up or down. Kind of a, I don't know, I guess I'm kind of thrown because if, if we vote on whether or not we uphold and if by chance it didn't pass, doesn't that automatic, shouldn't that automatically mean that we, it, it's reversed? Uh, rather than having to go back and having a second vote, I mean, I guess. Well, the, the options, it, the, according to the ordinance, you can uphold it, uh, overturn it, or modify it. So if it's not upheld, you still got the option of modifying it. So okay. you you would have to decide then between right. those two. That clears it up. Thank you. Any other questions from council? One other thing. Thank you. Um, I had the same question. Well, the, the if it, the and I think David asked that last time. The it all that was argued or all that was proposed was that the points be. If the council made the decision that it was overturned, that there should not have been a, a financial penalty at all because they did not violate the ordinance then I would say necessarily that would mean the points would go away too. Just, but if there's a modification, I don't think that would necessarily impact the points because there, there is some penalty. Y'all just determined it was not as you much. Just said that they could appeal the fine. They're not up for appeal, but logic, I try to do logic. If, if, if it's overturned, okay. then it, that would go with it. Right. But th we're not... Y'all can't change the amount of points or do anything with the points. And the only way, even if you even if you said, for the sake of argument, we're not going to impose the penalty, but you don't say that they did meet the standards or they, if, if you, it was just to give them a break for the first time or something like that, then that wouldn't impact the points. If you said, we find that they were in compliance, then it would take away the points also. That's splitting the hairs, but that's... That's uh, okay. But that's a better explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Ms. Hill? No, ma'am. Okay. Very good. Um, Mr. Hargett. Thank you. Uh, members of the council, before I begin tonight, I prepared a binder to give out. It's got some documents. I'm not going to go through them all as you look at it, but it does have some documents that I would like to cover with you tonight. Mr. Hargett, can we... Uh, Caution, we are just here to the appeal for the fine. So if we can limit that, the discussion to just the fine and the appeal of that, um, any other request would need to be at another council meeting. Um, with, all, with all due respect, this, this is our appeal, I guess, um, Madam President, of, of the entire penalties that were assessed against our client. I'm going to discuss the background facts from our perspective and then also talk about the the fine I'll, i will also address the points as well just be, just because i want to make sure that it's understood and we don't waive any rights on the appeal as well because the last thing i want to do is come here uh, for our client and then not uh, not raise every issue that we're here to appeal about if that makes I'm sense get, i'm going to get clarification from our attorney we are here Chip, for the uh progression of the fine for being late not making financial penalty percent. correct okay. financial Financial penalty and points. So we are not Financial here. penalty only. Right. The ARB is used to hear other issues that first response would have on why they may not have made that time. Is that correct? So council is just here to listen to the appeal for the fine. Yeah, for the financial penalty. But it, it, the, including that argument could be a justification for why they That was what was argued to the, to some degree, to the ARB is why they couldn't make the times. And so that part of it would be appealable. Okay. Uh, it would be up to you. My position is that if their argument is this is not what the ordinance should say, that I think needs to come up through the ARB and, and come to the council. But that's completely within your, your discretion whether that figures into your argument about whether or not it should be there. But whether or not they were in compliance is what I would anticipate the argument would be. And I just want to get us in a road so we're not here indefinitely. Um, and 
I would support that, Chip. I think that if there's any question or any concerns they have with the existing ordinance, that they bring that to the ARB first. That is our process and procedure. Um, that, that's what uh, Mr. Childers asked a couple of meetings ago how to handle that, and that and that's what I, we were we told just, them there. I don't know that tonight we're going to take the expanded time to do all of the problems they may have with the ordinance that aren't really necessarily related to the, this appeal, this particular time appeal. I, I will say that the, that is completely within y'all's discretion. That is a position I agree with, but should you disagree with that position and want to hear more of an argument, that is whatever figures into your mind on whether or not the financial penalty is appropriate, y'all can consider. Our, our position is that whether or not the ordinance is valid is not one of those issues. Gotcha. Mr. Hargett, we'll give you some latitude, but please stay on the road sure. of the... And, and, I, and I'm not here tonight, uh, Madam President, to argue that the whole ordinance is invalid. That's maybe for another time and another place, and I understand that. But I think the points and the fine, as, as you were discussing, uh, well, Mr. Alexander, at the very beginning, go hand in hand. And if, if this council ultimately decides to reverse uh, the penalties, uh, whether that's the fine and the penalty points go together, then that's a, a, an argument that we will make it at this time on both of those. But no, no, ma'am, we don't intern, intend to argue every issue, and I'll stay focused on the issues at hand on the fine and the penalty points from our perspective tonight. Right. And I totally support that being in an ARB meeting, so don't think I'm not in favor sure. of it. Sure, understood. Stay on a, on a road, please. Thank understood. You. On August 19, 2019, the council adopted the ambulance ordinance. That's behind tab one in your binder. It's a, it's a complete set of the ambulance ordinance that was adopted in August of 19, just a few short months ago. Within that ordinance, the EMS coordinator, Mr. England, uh, is given broad power to enforce uh, those ordinances of the city of Decatur against the ambulance provider first response. It includes the ability of the EMS coordinator to assess fines and penalty points for violations. Once adopted, again, just a few short months ago, before the pandemic, as you know, the council has had little day-to-day -day involvement that's been left to the EMS coordinator and to the ARB board since that time, and it's only before this particular body on an appeal. And as Mr. Alexander explained at the beginning, not a lot of guidance, a ton of guidance as to what can or can be done and, uh, and what, this, what this body uh, may choose or not choose to do. But we're here tonight because on February the 11th of 2020, February 11th of 2020, the EMS coordinator sent a letter to first response assessing it with a $10,000 fine and, and 10 penalty points <clears throat> under section 3-20H4 of the ambulance ordinance. That letter, a copy of it, is behind tab 2 if you want to see it, what it looks like in your binder. The pertinent part of that particular ordinance that's in question is recited in the letter, but it states this. It says, based on fractal response time analysis, essentially a percentage of calls versus percentage of calls that complied with the response time. 90% of all E911 generated emergency call responses each quarter within the police jurisdiction that area outside the city limits, mile and a half outside the city limits, shall be achieved within 12 minutes or less. A violation of this provision, not meeting the 90%, will result in a financial penalty of $10,000 and 10 points for the first incident. The first incident is what we're here appealing tonight. The fine and penalty points assessed using this section are based on data related to calls that are dispatched by Morgan County E911, the entity that first response is required to contract with under the newly adopted ambulance ordinance. And we're here about the fourth quarter of 2019. That's the months of October, November, and December 2019. While the response times uh, requirements in the ambulance ordinances call for uh, for calls in the Decatur city limits and the police jurisdiction are out of line with other comparable jurisdictions. And again, I'm not going to get into all of that. I have submitted the correspondence that, that sums all of that up behind tab number eight in the binder that I provided to you. But I'm not going to get into all that tonight for the sake of time and also honor the council's request that we stay on the calls that are here. 
uh, that we're here about, and it's out of line with the national standards. But setting that aside for now, there are compelling reasons supporting first response's argument that the fine and penalty points should never have been assessed in the first place. Compelling reasons. On February 10, just a day before the uh, fine and penalty points were assessed by Mr. England, E911 sent an email summary to first response of the calls dispatched and responded to in the fourth quarter of 2019. If you look behind tab number three in the binder, I'll direct you to the last page there. And it's a summary from E911. It says there were 82 calls for that particular quarter. This resulted uh, in an 85.4% because uh, compliance rate because 70 of the calls had a response time uh, of 90% or greater. So there was only an 85.4% compliance if the numbers that are used there by E911 in the data that was provided is correct. If it's correct, then that percentage is correct and that fractal response time analysis is correct. But I will tell you tonight, based on what I'm going to tell you in the documents, I'll show you that those numbers are not correct. And that should not have been the percentage that was used to calculate the fractal response time. Four of the 12 calls should not have been counted against first response. Four should not have been counted against. So we've narrowed it down now from 82 calls total down to 12 that were deemed to be not in compliance uh, for the police jurisdiction. And now I'm telling you that there's four calls that we're actually going to spend the time talking on, talking about tonight. So you're saying there are four calls that were in compliance? That were there were four there calls of the 12 that, that were considered out of compliance that should have been included. Of the four calls... I have to back up one second. Sure. Is that four in addition to the 82? No, sir. Okay. No, sir. Are you saying four, four in addition to 70? I'm saying four were incorrect. Okay. Yes, sir. That's what I'm saying. Four the 12 were wrong, so so instead of having one. 70 correct calls, it's 74, 74 correct calls. is what you're saying. Yeah, I think you yeah, let, yeah let, correct. I'm sorry. I didn't you know, know, it's right. fine. It's fine. fine. I, I think I'm going to cover that here. And just look, uh, but yes, that's a good, good question. Four of the calls should not be counted against first response. With those four calls included as compliant for purposes of calculating the first, for fourth quarter times, first response meets the fractal response time. If you, if you want, I've gone ahead and done the numbers. I can see you guys out with your calculator and your pens. You're sitting there doing them too. 74 of 82 of the calls would be 90.24% compliance. And there's actually one call that would have been an exception. That should have been an exception. And I'll explain again what the ordinance says about that in just a second and why that matters. But if you take that exception into play, it doesn't matter. Because we, we get the exception and it still is 90.12% compliance and would comply with the ordinance as well. Either way, we meet the 90% requirement when I talk to you about these four calls. For three of the calls, first response verbally arrived on the scene, on location, within 12 minutes. Verbally arrived on the scene of the call within 12 minutes. For one call, again, there's an exception that is documented. If you'll turn to what's behind tab five, there's a summary of those 12 calls on the spreadsheet. If you see it right there in front of you as we go through. I've highlighted the four calls that I'm going to spend the time talking about tonight. First response drivers. Hey, when since we don't have a book, can he make reference to the date and time? So can you tell, can you, can you tell me what calls they were? Because I don't know if I have the right calls. I didn't know if an exception form was turned in for these calls or not. That's what I'm looking for. Maybe a table over here, Chip. Use mine. Here, use that. All right, move, move ahead. Uh, Ms. Tab Chief, five. Chief Englander, what page? Tab five. I'm ready to go. Okay. Yes. Tab five. Council President, give him my book. <laughs> Do you have an extra book? I have an extra book. I don't. And anyone? And I'll get. I can continue. Could I have her copy? Sure. So I can think. It's right here on the table. Okay. Thank you. Feel free to make notes in it. Thank you. Didn't think about that, Chrissy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Once 
what's the... Uh, Hold on one second. Yes, sir. There are no headings on this spreadsheet. Some of them are obvious. But when it gets into the red column of numbers, we have no idea what those are. Yes, sir. And I'll, I'll talk to you about that as we, as we walk along. The, uh, the red column there is the auto uh, response time that was calculated. 12 minutes is 720 seconds, so those are seconds. So if you see the times there and those being out of compliance, the 12 calls that were deemed to be out of compliance, if you see a number over 720 in that red column, then that would mean it's greater than 12 minutes. <clears throat> uh, let me get clarification. Just for clarification for everyone, city calls are eight minute requirement correct. or seconds. Whichever way you want, if it's eight minutes. Right. And PJ calls are what? Twelve. 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 Okay. Thank you. Sorry. No, you're fine. You're fine. Of these 12 calls, first response drivers questioned several of the calls that were deemed out of compliance when they saw the sheet and realized that this was these were the calls that, that had been deemed to be greater than 12 minutes from starting point to getting to the scene because they specifically remembered arriving in a time that was shorter than that. Thereafter, first response requested an investigation into the calls, which was done and resulted in this spreadsheet being prepared. And this is the, the spreadsheet that resulted from that. For three of the calls on the bottom of the spreadsheet that you're looking at, and I will, I will point to them by address, it, the Norris Mill Road is toward the middle of the page, Starkey Road, as well as Mud Tavern Road. You will see that on each of those, the Norris Mill Road was deemed to have uh, auto-arrived in 777 seconds. Tell me what auto-arrived is. Auto-arrived is a computer system, essentially a um, automatic vehicle locator system that is in the ambulances that once the, once the ambulance leaves the station, it begins and once it gets to the actual point or scene of the accident, the computer system run through a GPS type program. You can kind of think of it different, but you can kind of think of it like a, like a, a Google Maps or something like that, just for simplicity purposes. Okay. That would tell you when it started, when it stopped. Okay. But it doesn't take into you said it when the wheels move. Yeah. So if the wheels don't move for two minutes, that doesn't count. I'm just trying to get. They don't start out on time. As soon as they get that call, that's what I was sitting here thinking the same thing. So if they don't start as soon as they get that call and hold off for 120 seconds, then it doesn't start until they pull away headed to the sink, correct? And I, I and if I would, I would def I would defer to Mr. Childers to answer that specific question. Okay. I, I can. According to the ordinance, and what I understand 911 does also, is when the call goes out, the time starts running on the computer. When the when the ambulance stops at the location, then a message is sent that stops it running. It it's all that's, automated that's because the the for the reason you don't want them when they're anybody, the police, fire, anybody when they're four blocks away they realize it's almost time and they call on the radio and say we're here. So it's, it's an automatic thing. The, okay. the call comes, 911 documents the call when it goes out on the computer and when the ABL says they're there is when it cuts off so there's no human involvement. Ms. Ferris, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to explain to us how that works, the two minutes that, that he's referring to. Yeah, the, um, the auto arrival is on Question. How does that information get to their computer system? How, how is it transmitted? Yes. It's a GPS system. Okay. So it's a GPS system. 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 So it's a G
And GPS, does that go to satellite? Does it go to internet? How does it go? It depends on what's in their um, vehicles, but I think that theirs are Sierra Wireless, and so it's a satellite. Basically, it's going to be the same. Oh, say, so it's somewhat dependent and upon the signal being available, too, isn't it? Thank you. And let me ask the two minutes that he's referring to. Uh, could you explain that? If, what the two minutes is about? From now, I'm not sure. Um, some of that they're talking about as far as the two minutes. There, there's no. Okay. And it's just major. Delay on, on okay. Service. Thank you, Ms. Pierce, who is 911 director. Sorry. Go ahead. So, and so just to clarify, <clears throat> this is a 911 computer system generated number. The, yes. The um, this comes as a report from our computer system. Okay, so you know when, when you know when the car, based on the GPS, you know when it goes out, and you know when it goes less than five miles an hour. Yes. Okay. That's whenever it documents. Um, That's when they're on the scene. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Let me go back to these three calls real quick. I want to explain why they're in compliance. Again, if you look at the auto arrive system that we just discussed, and I'll talk to you about some of the errors. Uh, with that system and flaws with that system that have been acknowledged by the ARB board, by E911 as well. It's documented in the, in the minutes of their meetings. But before I do that, I want to make sure you understand why these three calls are in compliance and they're not out of compliance. If you look first at Norris Mill Road, it says it arrived in 777 seconds. Out to the right side of that in bold, it says auto arrive. That's the, again, the auto arrive time that was just explained. But the ambulance driver for first response radioed arrival at the scene at 575 seconds. Again, well within compliance of the 12 minutes. The same procedure that the Decatur Fire and Rescue, the department uses in radioing their times in to uh, report response times. If you go down to the next one, Starkey Road, again, auto arrived 862 seconds. There again, the ambulance driver radioed in arrival at 710 seconds, again, arriving well within the 12 minute mark in the police jurisdiction. The final call there again, Mud Tavern, 769 seconds was the auto arrive time, which would be late, but the driver actually radioed in arrival 568 seconds, again, well within the 12 minute, 720 seconds requirement. Yes, sir. Okay. Is there a problem with times? You mentioned that this is something that has been discussed at the ARB board. Is this something that, you know, from my standpoint, you can call in on the radio and say you're there when you're three miles away. So either the, either the system is accurate or it's not. Is there a problem with the system? There is not always a problem in the system. There's, um, I think there's a couple of things important for the council to know about some of this procedure that it is. Yes, it is a computer system. It's a technology-based um, system. I'm not going to say it's 100% foolproof because nothing is. Um, as far as some of these versus auto arrive versus verbal, first response made a decision that they did not want us to arrive a unit when they said it verbally. They wanted the auto arrive to do it to, um, if you want to call it, make sure the unit was there. So that's where some of these time discrepancies come in is because we don't arrive in verbal when they say it verbally. Um, some discrepancies can happen if, for example, somebody has a really long driveway and the ambulance isn't pulling all the way up to the house, then that auto arrive may not pick up because it may be within that, not within that barrier of where it says the location is. So there are possible discrepancies as there is within the type of thing. Is, you said that first response asked to be on the auto arrive system, not the verbal system. Do you have in writing where they asked for that? Yeah, I have um, probably back in 2015 uh, was a correspondence that I was able to track down where they wanted us to utilize the auto arrive. So we also do not, we cannot have ABL data, we do not keep ABL data on their truck's movements the past 30 days because of file and we just don't have the ability to do that. So we can only go back to check where their trucks were for about roughly 30 days is an approximate time. These particular instances we cannot go back and check and see where the trucks really were. Okay, and 
I'm not sure which one of you, probably Chip. There has to be a process for the appeal of each time. The, what is that time frame if they see their results and go, wait, that's the discrepancy? How long do they have? Do they have within that 30 days to communicate that to the ARB? At any point when they see that uh, they believe there was an error in time, uh, the 320H5 in the code uh, lets them uh, request an exception. Uh, I think we've got several that they did during that quarter. One was approved, others were not. But if they, if in fact, um, first quarter of this year, uh, they challenged that the time of arrival was not correct, that the AVL had messed up. We looked into it, verified with 911 that there was an error and took that off. And so their, what would have been their second out of time came off because they challenged it. We checked the numbers and, and checked the, their figures and, it, and there was an error. But it relies on them saying, I think we were there in time. You need to check that. Ms. Ferris, let, let me ask you, do you give them in the appropriate time that information to overlook to see there is a discrepancy? What is your turnaround date to give them what you have to verify? They get reports nightly. Nightly. Okay. Uh, yeah, at midnight they get that previous day's reports for, um, for the time that they have been in the system. They get reports nightly and they get them as soon as possible. Just to get back here, though, again, those three times, I'll move on from that here in just a second. But again, auto arrive differs from the verbal or radio time of arrival. If you look at the auto arrive system, there are numerous reasons. Some of them have already been mentioned. I would point the, point the uh, council to what's behind tab nine in the May ARB meeting minutes uh, that are there. Uh, you will notice that there is an acknowledgement of inconsistencies and discrepancies with the E911 auto arrive system. And just to give you an idea of the, of the errors that are that, and problems that there are with that system, Decatur Fire doesn't even use the auto arrive system. They do a verbal response when they get to the scene, uh, similar to what is documented here that would show first response in compliance. Um, it's, it's just a different way to do it, and, and I would assume that if, if Decatur Fire used the auto arrive system, that would be a more accurate system, but they don't. They use the verbal arrive. And let me, did, let me, did first response request, do you agree that you did request to use the auto arrive and not the radio? Yes, yes, at first we sure did, and then we started learning about But it. did you request it be changed? No, we can okay. kind of do a mixture of both. Well, I mean, to me it's hard for you to say, I like it sometimes and don't like it others. Either you need to be going with the radio or you need to be going with the, the other. Right. But but that's we, we prefer to go to direct communication via radio because it's more dependable internet not dependable on PJ. That's what they do now. Yeah, so we I told them to pick one and we're gonna pick both. Right. So but, uh, let me ask you a question though. If, if you do choose the direct communication um, and they're fudging the numbers. Can you tell with the auto arrive still that, or, or can you tell by GPS that they're fudging the numbers? They're not actually there. They're two miles out. Yes, we um, we have now in place with them doing it verbally that if the auto arrive is different by a significant amount, that we're, we'll go back and review those calls and send them to first response and say, hey, your auto arrive is three minutes later than your verbal is this, and we can review them at a time that we still have the data for the. Was that the case with these three bottom numbers? You didn't, uh, you weren't notified. We did not pull that information at this time. I mean, we were still doing auto arrive. They were still doing auto arrive thirty this time. Okay. Question, Mr. Childers, when you chose the auto arrive way back when, at that time, did you know whether there were problems with the system? In choosing that, were you using that to try to con uh, control employees from cheating your system? Okay. Then I'll follow that. Mr. Childers and Mr. Tindall, did I and Ms. Hill not meet with you probably two or three times where we suggested if you have a discrepancy, please go through the process and do that. At the time
time, we were told that it was a very lengthy process and we just didn't have time to do that. And I can't give you the exact date, but when Chief Grandy was here, at one point, a barrage, and I believe maybe y'all can uh, address this, uh, Chief, like one day there were probably a hundred, uh, you know, discrepancies. So I, we, and I know this was at least in 17 or 18 that Christy and I both said, hey, then turn them in. If you have a discrepancy, you need to know if that system's not working. We pay a great deal of money for right. the city to, to fund them. And, and we're the largest municipality that do that. So we need to know that too. Uh, so, uh, and I'm gonna let Chief, because I was in attendance at this meeting on May 12th, not only, tell me your process when you go up to a fire, when you get there and what your process is and what we have as the city to double check that we are where we are and if we say it verbally and everything that we go into the city to do. We, we currently have, like, like they said earlier, we do announce on scene via the radio, but there's also an AVL system on our, each of our engines that they can go back and look and see. They, we do have that. It's just historically, the fire service has always went on scene via the radio because we give what's called an on-scene report. Whether we have a structured fire, medical car, whatever, we give an on-scene report. So that's why we use the radio more so than the AVL system. But we do have AVL capabilities on each one of our engines and our trucks. Even the, even but the truck I drive <coughs> has AVL system in it. So we do have that capability. Ms. Ferris, do you ever go back and verify that the fire department are actually, when they get there and give an on scene report, that they're there with their AVL system? Only if it's a report or a, um, if there's a, a consideration or if there's a question about it, we don't understand Okay. Thank you. But the ABL system, not to be confused with the auto arrive system, it, well, you, not, not, not exactly the same thing. You have to have ABL system to have the auto arrive system. You can't have one without the other. Sure, but the way Decatur Fire does it would actually require a, a person actually pushing a button to determine when they get there that's located inside their truck versus the auto arrive system that's based on stop and start no, and I, actually a pinpointed location actually, of arriving in the scene. What you said is correct, but we could also do it so that once we could do the auto arrive on our trucks also, since we have an ABL system with the Sierra Wild. We have the same sure. capabilities as, as first response does. We just don't utilize the auto arrive system because historically, like I said before, we use the radio to give our own steam reports. I, I was just making the distinction that they're not exactly the same. Yeah, but the same you thing. have to have ABL to have auto arrive. To have auto arrive, you have to have ABL. Chief, walk me through the process. Once you get to a fire, you radio in. Yes. The ABL is always going, or yes. I'm assuming we get an alert that is broken, needs to be maintained. Mm -hmm. Do you push a button, since he has brought up a button that we haven't talked about, do you the, push a button when you get there? Some of our guys do. Some of them don't, just because a lot of the, a lot of the older lieutenants that are not as tech savvy don't want to use the system. Okay. The, uh, the, newer, the newer guys, they're more tech savvy. They like using the system better. If I could run to my truck real quick, I will get my phone and I'll be able to show you where every fire engine in the city of Decatur is at this present time. I'm going to run and get there real quick. I left that one in my truck. Thank you for explaining our process. Go ahead. Yeah, we talked about the technology, the GPS problem. If you, as you go further out, remote areas, dead zones, problems with that, with the auto arrive, not being able to document because it doesn't have a signal in certain cases, but there's also the human factor as well that you heard referenced earlier. When, when within that cab system, a dispatcher actually has uh, to record the arrival time on the other end once that happened, and that does take time to make that, that recording. And when you're talking about a matter of seconds, right, and the time limits that are imposed by the ordinance, seconds matter in this instance, particularly here when everything is operating on a thin uh, margin of error. Um, I guess as we go here, we, we talk about this and we think about there's acknowledged inconsistencies, acknowledged irregularities, acknowledged problems with the system, and to penalize and to find first response when there are known problems with the system, to me is just unfair and unjust in that circumstance. It would be different, it would be different if we were coming here and we didn't have any disagreement over what the computer program was and it operated correctly and there was a 99.9999999% accuracy rate. We're not talking about that. We're not. 
What we're talking about is a system that's flawed and there's been changes made and requested by first response to go to a, a verbal response time just as Decatur Fire does that will be more accurate and if there's, if, again, if there are inconsistencies or something with that, then that can be worked out apparently with Morgan County uh, E911 to verify that those calls uh, are actually um, correct and they're at the scene when they're made. Um, so if you take those three calls on the bottom, that's a, the explanation for those is the verbal response time meets it. I've explained to you why we use the verbal response time and the fact that first response has actually changed because of the problems with the computer system to going to that verbal radio communication uh, time. I'm sorry, one moment. Ms. Ferris, I have another question. You're saying in 2015 you had evidence that it was requested by first response to go by your auto time. Um, and I'm assuming that since then, first response has asked now to go by verbal time. Do we have a written statement of when that occurred? Was that after this fine had been? Uh, the verbal was actually initiated by me because of, to resolve these issues because I don't want to keep going back and forth because we can't check their ADL. So that was initiated by me roughly a month ago. I don't have the exact date, but it was. Okay, so that, that was within a month's set time. Yes, yeah, so now we, um, we utilize their verbal response time. Okay. Um, we still track the auto arrive, but that's not the time. Okay. So you still have no nothing written that, that asked that, although you did request it a month ago? I do have correspondence with Mr. Children. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Question. Uh, well, we have an opportunity to hear from the Decatur Fire Department why these were denied. I mean, if if there if there truly if there is an issue with the ADL, then there's got to be a reason. I'm sure they made a presentation or a reason to you that this was not right and at, you denied those. At the ARB, they did not make that argument. They had filed exceptions in what and uh, what? Mr. Hart, if you would flip over to tab six, I'm going to take over Mr. Hart's book real quick. Uh, there is one of the requests for uh, response time exception forms. You saw that first response deems that they will. Like, you sent me today. If any call that they go over their eight minutes or 12 minutes time, which is 12 minutes, is what we're discussing right now, they can submit one of these forms to my office. When I get this form, I look at it. If you look at a lot of these forms here, it asks several different questions. But the one, some of the ones I look at is the address, of course, where their trucks are located at. A lot of times, you see out there in the middle, it says other LS units available in location. If I don't know where their other trucks are, I can't make a judgment based whether this truck was closer or not. Uh, then they are able to give a, a certain reason right there in the middle, detail specific circle, uh, circumstances. I look at that, but then also, if you look right above there at the times, I know they've been arguing about the uh, the AVL auto arrive time or radio times. If you look at the dispatch time, this one is at 10.50, and the in route time is at 10.52. So it took this truck roughly almost two minutes to go in route. When I look at that and I say they had a total response time of 12 minutes and 29 seconds, if you cut that through uh, dispatch time to in route time down to one minute then they would have made their times in plenty of time that's some of the things I look at now the, he's the other uh, four calls he's only got one listed here or showing the time exception forms for one call I have all four of them right here on all the ones that Mr. Hargett has presented it on there that have got a uh, the yellow markings, he has four of them. I have all four right here if y'all would like to see them. Uh, Stacy, could you please have someone from your office make copies of those four for uh, council as well, well as uh, uh, first responses attorney, please? Five, six, five. Who determines who sends the closest unit? That's uh, not one one determines that now based off ABL system. That's one thing that we So why discuss. would that be an issue of whether or not the closest unit was sent? Correct. If it's, a, if it's an accurate system that's not flawed and we're using the CAD system, then they should send the closest unit and that should be it with no issue. Unfortunately, as we've already mentioned, the system's not perfect. Do you, now, 
on this, this is a good example. If you're try do you have access to your ABS information, your GPS, like 911 has? Does first response have that same access? That access, E911 will have that information. Okay, so you don't keep a um, first response log of your individual trucks? Not, and if I'm understanding you correctly, a, if you're talking about a real time, see it right in that exact moment, that's going to be done, uh, my understanding, through the CAD system. It's okay. maintained I by. guess my question is, does first response, are they available, is that information available to them as the, I would think, the, as the owner of the software, they would have access to that, access to that just as much as 911 have. Is that correct? There you go. That's the, uh, that portion called OpsCAD. Could you do that if you had server space and if first if you wanted to, let's say that you wanted to then have your own access to your own information, regardless of what 911 had, could you then provide, I mean, it would take IT, that would of course cost money, but could you do that? I mean, is that theoretically possible? Could you have a server that could hold all that information? Like she said, they can only hold it 30 days. Could you theoretically hold it 30 days to review? I think, and what knowledge I have about the we would get a username and password to log into their server and their system. And so everything has to be housed at 911. And then we would have the security credentials, if you will, to, to log into their OSCAD and be able to see the same thing that they see on the report scale. But do you financially pay for the ABS systems that go in each of your trucks or does 911? We pay for the system. The, Yes. You pay for uh, the system. Subscription. Okay. So you're telling me you don't have it you don't have access to a subscription that you pay for? We utilize the GAD, the ADL. They have the software for it. But you could as an individual business go out and have that software where you could keep that yeah. for thirty days, twenty days. That's only sold to nine one one. If you keep going here on this, this last call I want to talk to you about the, is listed at the top of the spreadsheet behind tab five. Uh, here again, first response was allegedly 29 seconds late. Again, if you look at the very first top red number, 749, 720 would be the number of seconds. So 29 seconds outside of compliance there. If you look over to the side, first response had actually verbally arrived 15 seconds earlier than that not within the time of 720 seconds, but it does again point to the fact of the inconsistencies with the system itself. But the reason this request should be accepted is if you look at the actual circumstances related to this particular call, uh, there was no good reason, no non-arbitrary reason not to refuse to grant first response an exception for this particular call. This is a call that was located on I-65. Now think about that for just a second with me. This isn't a home address like we just looked at that says Norris Mill Road and has a specific street address where you know where exactly you're sending the ambulance. It isn't the Starkey Road address where you know exactly where you're sending the ambulance and there's a pinpoint there to where it auto arrives on time. This is not an exact address. It's on I-65. That's a problem in and of itself in making sure that you can with the times, but go further than that and look at the box with me on uh, behind, what's behind tab six at the form we just looked at, the request for uh, response time exception form that was completed. This call was made on a day that it was torrential rain outside, heavy rain. They were going uh, to a call where a driver hydroplaned again on I-65, there was slow traffic, and there was an 18-wheeler that would not yield the right of way and block traffic on them trying to actually get to the scene. Um, they ambulance actually had to drive down uh, the shoulder, hard shoulder of the road to make it to the accident scene. One of those 
reasons alone would justify an exception and a reason for first response as ambulance to have been late to that particular call, which is exactly why the ambulance ordinance that this council adopted provides for exceptions, right? But here, here, here's the thing. Mr. England had mentioned just a second ago a, a reason that this, that this particular exception was denied, but it was different than what he said in his email that denied the request to Mr. Childers, because if you turn over to the last page of what's behind tab number six, it'll be the last page there. Mr. England said, time exception was denied, highlighted on incident numbers, and it's got the incident number for the call that I'm referring to there that's highlighted on the end and ends in 4634 due to incomplete forms. That's why it was denied. That was the reason given to Mr. Childers. That was the basis for the denial in February. Yeah, at the time this, the request was submitted. If you go back to that, that's, the form is not incomplete. Matter of fact, it's fully complete. If you read the ordinance itself and you look at section 3-20H5 that addresses exceptions, it says there that on the exception forms, what is required is the date. Let's see if that's there. The date is on it. Date of call, October 30, 2019. It requires the time, which is on there as well the dispatch time, as well as the en route time, as well as the on scene time, and the total response time, four different times listed. And it also says the specific circumstances causing the delayed response. And those are listed there. And again, any one of those would be a reasonable basis and should have been a reasonable basis for this to have been an exception for an ambulance driver trying to get to the scene of an accident on I-65 in the middle of a torrential rain with an 18-wheeler blocking traffic. And- Wonderful question. Uh, I'm assuming Station 8 would have responded to that call, and also the police would have responded yes, to that call. Yes, ma'am. And uh, this call right here, I know for a fact the fire truck was there, so I know Mr. Hargis said it have been hard to find this call because it's not a specific address. But I know for a fact the fire truck was on the side of the road with this car because the person that they transport from this wreck is one of my very dear friend's daughter. She was the one in this wreck and she called me after she wrecked. And I was on the phone with her and until the fire truck got there. Ms. Ferris, let me ask you. They're right there, if you read where it says like that ALS unit's available, and then right there it says, right below where it says detail specific, it says incomplete and improperly completed forms will be automatically disapproved. So you're telling me that other ALS units are required? According, when this form was created, this was the form that we used. Okay, Since then, does, it, does it say that in the ordinance? I would have to look in the ordinance. I mean, there's a discrepancy. Yeah, and, and there may, there, and if there is, this form, this is the same form we used from the previous ordinance until now. We just carried this form over well, because I everybody I'm just saying, is it in the ordinance, Jim? I, I don't I don't think it says the specifics of what's in here. What I understand is on the form is everything they need to in order to I, make a decision. I understand, but we're talking about holding people accountable. Sure. And if it says specifically what is required, you can't, I, I, it's I, I supposed to go on something I'll that said we, you, we've always done it this way. I understand. Let me I, see I, I, want be, I want to be fair to the parties to see if they are being... Because but and I have a legal question like that kind of piggybacks on this. Okay. I think their beef would then be with 911 because we contract with 911 to do this for the city of Decatur. We don't do this in house. So if they're saying, you know, they're alleging in, in all of these, if you've had time to look, say that another unit was closer, but not specific to, you know, anything like that, then then that's going to be 911's responsibility to say no. We have the we can show you where X ambulance was well, here, which is closer. This says it was denied because of it was not completed correctly. If I understand, yes, right. What? And I just want I I need to know if it what per the ordinance was it completed or and not no. one's got nothing to do with that. I, I, so, Chuck, and that's I may I'm have the answer. Yours, but I think a, a their court. issue is going to be with 911 and how they verify that another unit was closer. 
we don't have that capability in house. So that is going to be more of a 911 question. Except that we require them to go through 911. Uh, the the answer yeah, to your question to in that in the section that deals with uh, response time exceptions, it says uh, the request for exception filed within 48 hours of the call in question. It has at a minimum the information, the date, the time, the specific circumstances causing the delay response. And then it says the burden of establishing good cause for an exception shall be with the provider which must have acted in good faith in the execution of the responsibilities. Go down a couple of sentences after that. The EMS coordinator shall have the authority to require additional information of the provider. So that's where these forms came from whatever they need that that he the and it was it was before actually the forms were created and according to the ordinance the ms coordinator has the authority to require the additional information which would include the AL, where the other als trucks were I is there i just want to make sure that we that we communicated with them if if actually if you needed more information did you request it from them and it was not provided or what possibly not on not on this particular call but i think mr tenno can uh, agree the last couple of days he's asked me for requests for why certain times and calls were denied and i've given them to him and i've also asked him not just today but several days in the past why why do you want what why is this tell me this where was this unit at things like that we try to have open line communication, but you know. And then I have a question because you just read the ordinance. It said that this, these requests have to be within 48 hours of the date of the call. The date of this call was 10 30 19. I see nowhere where the date of when this request was turned in. Maybe I'm missing it. Uh, uh, where, mis you, you where Mr. Tindall signed, there is no date. Uh, and I don't yeah. see a date of when he turned this in. Was it within the 48 hours? I have yes. no idea. Yes, it oh, is. Right. Okay. I, when he emails, when he emails them to me, if it's outside the 48 hours, I send him one back, and then I also send Samantha at dispatch saying that this is outside of the 48 hours, which you know. Well, I, I think where the signature is down here, I, everyone has to sign their signature and date. I would suggest you put the date when he submits it. I can that that add that to if what, if what Madam President said is correct. Then should we not have a sign off for 911 stating that this was the most available unit? So there's no question. I think we should. What? But well, she's telling me she did. I, mean, yeah. I, 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 I don't believe that's something we should. brought into us like that within that 30 day period. And first response, I'll access. We're just the keepers of it. They yeah. can ask for any of that information anytime. If, if Mr. Art. Do you have any verbal or written communication that they asked for a snapshot of this? No. They did not. Instance? They did not, okay. And the reason is, if you look right below where the signatures are, there's a little spot that says dispatch review requested. Mm -hmm. So if they, need, if they don't believe the times are correct, if they don't believe it was the closest unit, then they can request a dispatch review of this. I will send it to Samantha, and then she sends me, sends me and Mr. Tindall back the results of, of but her But they didn't findings. check that box. But they did not check that box on this one. So that would... That would invoke a it's procedure just, that we have in process that you automatically yes. would send a 911 to review, but that was box was not, box was not checked on. That box point. was not checked. If that box. Dispatch review is when we think that dispatch made an error. That's been going over several times in the EMS community and the ARB. Dispatch review is when we think that the EMS made an error. Then we can send it back to the EMS to look at. Yes, I agree with that 100%. If he, if he believes that there's an error with their, with their times, if they believe there wasn't the closest truck there, then they can request a dispatch review. It is sent to them, and then, because I mean, if, the, if if dispatch is not sending the closest truck, that's a dispatch error. If the times are not correct on here, if they believe they was on scene faster than the ABL show with the radio show, that's a dispatch error, so they would ask the dispatch review this call. So, I'm looking at all the ones that you provided the other four. I don't see where that box at the bottom has been checked. 
Uh, and on your example, the box is not checked either. That it, I mean, and obviously there's a procedure for dispatch review request that would, as I see it, be out of the city's hands because we contract with 911 to do those dispatch review. They have the cat. Sure, so the, 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 this particular then, form was, again, I just want to go back to why this was denied. Well, it's yeah, really it incomplete. Denied for it, incomplete, it, incomplete well, it, wasn't. it is. If, if he did not check the dispatch review request, that is incomplete. If he meant to and didn't check it, that, I mean, if he wanted a request to review it, this box should have been checked. No, no, no. We're, we're off base. Wait, why are we off base? Wait, wait, one second. Why are we off base? Is that not the procedure and process? If they want it to be checked to make sure the closest unit was available, they check this box. I actually had one come across my desk today, and Jason, you sent it in, Medic 319, Basic 319 was dispatched on a call. The crew asked if, the crew asked if they was the closest unit, because they believed there was another closest unit. You didn't actually mark the dispatch review. I actually sent it to Samantha myself out of, just to find out, hey, is this right or not? So yes, we can check. She can go back and take a snapshot of that if it's if it's within the 30 days because that's how much they're they're following home well they would have to forward this request within 48 hours yes they would have to forward the request within 48 hours and then i look like i told like this previous state where i look from top to bottom i've even i've even got on there and look and google from their office to the call just to see what kind of what traffic it was and that's why i came up with arb let huh? me ask you this yeah. can you provide any of these requests that that box is checked They do have some. I don't know if, uh, if any of these have it or not. Are those important? Has the box not being checked been the reason that any form has been denied in the past? I'm sorry? Has the box not being checked been the reason that any form has been denied in the past? No, sir. Okay. But I'm saying if they want it to be reviewed, they need to check the box. And in my opinion, if you want it to be reviewed and then not check the box, in my opinion, that's incomplete. Let's check, right? Yes, yeah, I have a question. Are those I've employees got, always on duty 24 hours later in order to get those forms in? Do you have access to their phone number in case you need to call them for emergencies or things like that? Can you contact them? Okay. So if there is a conflict, you can call them and ask their uh, what account to what happened. Okay. Paige, on, yes. um, I've got the ones that they asked for exceptions for. Uh, exception for a call on Deer Road. 12 3 of 19, uh, and the box is checked uh, that they requested a dispatch review on that one. Correct. Time, it's, it's at the bottom of this page. What am I, what are we missing? I mean, I, if I'm missing something because this is a time exception form, on the bottom of this page it says dispatch review request. Right, but we, but we were not asking for a review request on this particular call Mr. Hardy was explaining. That's not the issue that he's trying to explain. I understand that. The reason this call was denied that Mr. Hargit is talking about now is one, you didn't meet the 12 minute time frame. Two, the form is incomplete because according to our standards. Not, it's not incomplete because the dispatch review request is on there. That's not why this form is marked incomplete. And I, I, I guess my point question to you, Mr. General, is to request, we don't have the CAD information. That's 911. That would therefore require a dispatch review request that 911 would provide you. We don't have that information, so if you don't check this box, Yes, I mean, well, I mean, he, I guess, can call her for you, but I don't know why you can't check the box or call her yourself and say, I need a snapshot. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just confused by the, the, you're asking us, we don't have that information. You need to be asking 911. Mr. Hardy, can I, do you have, can I add just a quote, just for my general knowledge? Why did you pick this specific call to look at in your book and not put the other three in there? Because the other three have got general reasons also why the, the crews requested a uh, request of a time exception. Because this, the reasons that are listed there, but on the basis of that call, we felt any any one of those justified okay. exception. Any one of those justified exception. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
that this particular call does not require a dispatcher. This, this is merely a submission, uh, a time exemption request from DFR for the reasons stated in the details in the bottom of the page. Yes, but you're requesting that another, you're saying in this request that another unit was closer. We don't have that information. No, she no, does. No, no, I, no, that's no, not, that's not. That's not okay, you're saying that there was a other ALS unit available. We, the not city of Decatur would not have, that's exactly what it says right here. It, where is you at on the? Right here where it says other ALS units available location. There's there's nothing. So no, there, it, it, there's no these, unit listed there as being closer though, Madam President. Right. On that but, on that form is what I'm saying. I, the, I thought I understood you just I understood what you were saying is we were saying that there was a unit closer. We're not. Okay. Because we're relying on what CAD's provided as being the closest unit. And you should because we don't have the information to verify verify that for you. So nine one one's gonna be our uh, verification as well as yours. So I guess my question, and I'll be quite honest with you, I've marked up mine with some writing. Um, I, I don't see where it's stated where specifically there's a problem or why you're requesting anything. Am I missing that? Does yeah. that, that yeah, doesn't go to the box right? about three quarters of the way down. Uh, okay, I see that. I see. How, how difficult is it for 911 to supply the other ALS unit positions and how long does that typically take? If they've only got 48 hours, if they call you, can you give them that information immediately? What? Yeah, we can. Um, it's usually uh, either a, a supervisor or a Samantha or um, an admin person is going to be able to get that information. Any of the dispatchers can pull back some of it, but they're not, it's a reporting part that they may not have access to. So we can, I mean, if, if that comes, if they fill out the exemption form, they have to have the form in 48 hours. They can ask us at any time and we'll get the information to them within that day or the next day. Any, if this is blank, is it automatically incomplete? No. It, I'm sorry, yes. If that right there is complete, yes, then automatically, according to the rule at the bottom, it is automatically in, it is automatically denied. It's not a complete form. Me and Mr. Tindall have talked about that before. Okay. And, and to clarify, there has never been a form, a time exception form granted for approval that is missing that information. I understand that correctly. Well, I, I can't say because remember me and you, we had a conversation and just like you had a conversation there, of, you know, if it's late at night, they have to pull records like that. And so. I have time exception form granted by DFR that is missing that information that was granted at the time of that. And I think it goes back to the ordinance itself, if you will. And I'm not, I'm not saying it's, I'm not pointing the finger, it's anybody's fault, it's your fault, or their fault, and bl putting blame on anybody. I'm just saying the ordinance itself requires the date, time, and specific circumstances. And that's probably the reason you're seeing a lot of inconsistency with that particular information, and you're seeing it that this particular form was denied due to being incomplete when it wasn't part of the ordinance itself incomplete. It but just the, wasn't. Hurdle, the hurdle that I'm having problems getting over, you and your clients know we do not have that information. We have to go through the same process tonight. We being? The city of Decatur. Okay. FDR, police department. Sure, okay. So if you know we don't have access, then I'm not, not quite sure why you're going through us as a, a tool to get it because we can't give it to you. We are essentially going to be then making a phone call to 911 that you could make. Well, well, and, and, and so, and that was in the ordinance. So in August, and then it sat for, it didn't go into effect until what, October, I think, I've got the date. Uh, October 12th, I believe. The effective date was the September so 22nd. It was published in the Decatur Daily in public. And so they knew the ordinance and what it said. So I guess my question is, that's been out there, the process, and they know that 911 has that access. That, then they need to make that call to 911 because they have the snapshot of what, and they can but, request it. But just, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, but I understand where we're coming from as well. We're submitting forms. Some of them have that information, some of it may not. Some of them are denied, some of them are not. Some of them that doesn't have the information that we're now here debating about today were approved for exception, can you see, I mean, can you see the inconsistency of what Not we're coming really, from trying a, to understand exactly well, what, no, well, what that is? Because it's a phone call, and Mr. Tindall, did you call for a snapshot for that, in this instance? We're, no, ma'am, and, and, and I still would not do a snapshot of that particular call today either. Okay. The reason, the reason what he's presenting is um, that I have time 
SNF forms that have been granted that, are, that have been missing that information, and they're still granted. Uh, so you're saying the process is not consistent? Well, I, I guess where my, my end also is, sense. where in the ordinance is a snapshot required? I don't think it uh, is in the ordinance, but if I were a business but owner... But holding us accountable for something that's not in the ordinance. No, no, but I would think as a business owner, you would, I think you have a con, you do have a contract with 901 separately to the city, right? Sure. You, that y'all have a contract that I don't, I'm not quite sure what it is, we can pull it. So just as a business owner, I would think you would want some accountability from 911. You're paying them or there's, there's a transaction there that they have that information. The city of Decatur does not. So there should be an open line of communication from the business owner to 911, I would hope. And so I, I guess my question is, maybe that should be a better communication line? And, and, and maybe that's something that can be worked out, I guess. But, but that's not gonna go into ordinance because we have, no, we have no authority of a separate contract they have with 911. But, but you do have the authority and, and, and the council exercise the authority by, by adopting the, the ambulance ordinance that, that doesn't have that in there, that procedure. Does that make sense of what I'm saying? But we don't have to require that procedure. That would be something 911 would require first response as a business owner that the city has completely left out of that loop. That would be something you'd need to talk with and rectify with 911 in your contract because you have a separate contract with them than you do with us. There is no contract with us, in fact. It is an ordinance. No, it's, it's required by the ordinance to be a contract between 911 and first response. That's well, correct. Yeah, they, because they have to do the dispatching. That's who they that does for the city. So I guess. That goes back to my question. They have a contract with them. The city does not negotiate that contract with a private business owner. So that would need to be a discussion between 911 and the business owner, not the city, because we have our separate contract with 911. Okay. The three okay. entities do not intermingle, except for when there's a question about the cats, where they were, and that thing. The, the 30 days of information she would have. Okay. Uh, I, I just, I, I'm not sure, as a business owner, yeah, I would make that communication very clear because I'm paying them a lot of money, just as the city is, and I would, I would expect some accountability. But can I, can I make one? You may. I think we've gotten kind of sideways because we're talking about inconsistencies in the, in the exceptions and in the requests and whether or not it's checked and stuff. I think the inconsistency that we're here about, the, the, the boiling it down to the fine point is, we're relying on the automated system to set the time, which is what first response asks for, and that's what they're getting. And so we've got automated from 911 that these calls, 12 calls in that quarter in the PJ were out of time. The argument that they made at the beginning of this discussion was that those automated numbers are wrong when in fact we should be relying on the radio traffic to get the, that's the inconsistency between the radio traffic and the automatic okay. we think the automatic is correct uh, not they asked for the automatic to be used there is a provision in place that says if you don't think that this is accurate you can ask for an exception and the code says the burden is on the provider to provide the information sufficient to overturn it. They did not do that. However, they did it. Whether so they, they did need it, to go through 911 per their contract, get the information and bring it to us? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying that it's up to them to show that those numbers are wrong. And if they do that by going to, I would go to 911 and get the information if I was that, running that's the business. That's what the spreadsheet is, is that right. investigation of the numbers, which shows radio times that are less than the automatic response time. But, that, but that's time, now is, six well, months after the fact. But what, well, this is the procedure to do it. We've walked through that procedure. We've complained about it in ARB meetings over and over again, and we're finally here. This is the result of the investigations, the spreadsheet behind, it, behind tab five, which is exactly what you just said we didn't do that we've provided. So I, I, there's, I don't know what else we could be asked to do. Well. I'm going to tell you, I, I came in here with a mindset of uh, letting this fund go and asking that 911 and first response work out their difficulties with the CAD, their uh, software system. But unfortunately, Ms. Uh, Ferris having documentation from 2015 where first response requested that it be uh, the way that they were doing it and, and didn't, and she initiated a month ago the conversation to change it to verbal, 
That's my problem. If you have Mr. Uh, uh, David, uh, you know, requesting that, hey, we do it with your CAD system and when the truck is rolling, when it stops, there was never a recension of that request. So I have to go with written information, and, and unless sure. David can prove to me that he wrote on whatever 1817, well, I, I, that he asked, okay, we're going to change that. And, and now I need it by this voice standard. Well, at the, at the time, Madam President, that they wanted to use the auto arrive, they weren't aware of all the flaws in the system. Once they figured out there were flaws in the system, this is a brand new ordinance. I mean, it is. We all know that. It's a couple of months. It's less than a year old. That's a new ordinance about in the law. That's new. I'm just, from a, from a legal standpoint, there's been no interpretation of this. Mr. Alexander pointed out this is the first appeal we've ever had. And there's not even a set procedure we've got, you know, for, for how, to con how to do it because it is so new. And I guess my point is, is we didn't know at the time all the errors that were with it, Madam President. We did request the auto response arrival time be used because we wanted it. We thought it would be good. We thought the GPS would, would be completely accurate. And now we found out all the inconsistencies and the errors with it. And we've moved to a system like Decatur Fire and Rescue uses that is more accurate. And, and, radio and, and if that had been in December or January or and February, maybe I would take an exception to that. But this is an 11 year process to even get this ordinance done. This has been on the table a long time and that is not your fault in knowing that. But it was passed in August, we have that. It was duly, by state law, advertised for months until October 22nd when it actually went into effect. So they had, uh, well, part of October, all of November, all of December, all of January, all of February, go, whoa, we got a lot of problems here. Let me write and tell them we don't want to go by what their information says because we see flaws, we want to go by voice. But that didn't happen until a month ago and it was initiated by the 911 director, not first response. And, by, and none of well, this. Well, there, there, there were inconsistencies and problem with the system which facilitated the conversation to be had between the two, which is what you had indicated that you wanted Ms. earlier. Ferris, did you not say you to have a conversation? The conversation? Did you initiate that conversation a month ago? I said that there were conversations. Okay, did you initiate a conversation a month yes, ago to go to verbal? Yes, to ensure that there was a consistent way of tracking them. In fact, also, the, this is a new ordinance, correct, but the time standards are the same, the, the exception forms are the same, the electronic systems were the ones that, that predated this ordinance as well, so they've been in place for longer than since September 27th. Well, they've been in place since October 19, and I would have thought before then they would have seen inconsistencies. If right, I'm, so, I'm saying it, it, for and years I'm not before that. they're not, because Ms. Ferris, you did it. We did talk about that in the 20, May 20th meeting that y'all agreed, and I think y'all have now purchased new software to maybe take care of any inconsistencies or be, uh, I guess, better at doing or tracking that. Well, it's I, mean, I, I appreciate your honesty. Mm -hmm. We've talked last week, and she's Miss Ferris has been nothing but completely up up front with me I, in, in my conversations. But for her to say that the CAD system is at the end of life, and yet we're going to sit here and hold first response accountable for a system that is failing and is going to be replaced, to me just seems completely out out of whack in trying to interpret the ordinance in a way that's fair. To indicate a business. And unfortunately, I do see your point, but I don't because if that was the question through many years that the software needed to be updated, then Mr. Uh, David or Mr. Tyndall could have uh, actually, in written form, said, okay, we don't trust your software. We want to go by verbal. I mean, that could have happened before this ordinance even took place if there was any question that the actual software was in question of being updated or not. I guess the and software hasn't question. always been failing. Though. I mean, at some point, I'm sure it was good software and it was usable and it was... Software changes all the time, but I guess my question is, they have an outside contract that the city of Decatur is not involved in at all. In that contract process between the two of you, and I'm just curious, did was there any conversation, first response to 911, hey, your software needs to be improved? No, this is, this is When was your contract signed last? October. Of 19. So you could have asked her then, 
I mean, you could have held off and said, we're not going to sign it until you tell us you're going to get new something. Ms. Ferris, would you have entertained the conversation? I mean, it, we're really out of this. We have no dog in that race. That's a contract between y'all two. And I guess, the, as a final call, those are the four calls. If you do the numbers, uh, you consider those four calls. The one exception, the three that were verbal response on time, it gets us above the 90% for the fourth quarter of 2019. And we feel that that warrants a full reversal of both the fine and the penalty points, both, um, in this instance. Um, you know, the, there's been some discussion. I think Chip clarified this and on the front end. And I'm, Chip, maybe I just misunderstood. I want to make sure I understand it from your position on this is that if, if the council ultimately determines that these four calls it put us above 90% and they reverse the decision, then they can reverse both the points and the fine, correct? What I, I want to understand what your position was. My position was, I think the question was asked, what if they're overturned? And what I said was, if they're overturned, it, like like Paige said a minute ago, I was willing to just give you a break this time and let them go. That would not be an indication that the system was wrong or that it not it hadn't been done. Or if they said, we think 10,000 is too much, we'll do 5,000, that wouldn't affect the points. If they said, we find that you were not out of compliance, then we would have no choice but to take the points away too because the there would be a factual finding that it was not warranted. So if they found the four calls were compliance, if like they, I just mentioned, then we right. then they could reverse both the fine and the points according If to they you. found that they should not that it, it never should have been imposed, then okay. that would also have to impact the points. So I, I mean I think based on that and based on what Mr. Alexander is saying that if, if the council finds that, they have the right and the authority, according to the city attorney, to, to reverse the finding of the fine and the penalty points. Um, we, we believe if you didn't do that, if, 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 if that were not the case, um, there's Alabama law, federal law on it, that it would be a denial of procedural and substantive due rights of our client under the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment. I don't want to get into a, a long legal discussion about that tonight. But there are strong legal grounds to challenge uh, that if denied procedurally or substantively. And procedurally means you just don't take it up, right? I'm not taking it up. We can't hear the penalty points. For substantively means our client would actually be denied a substantive due process right, right? Like the fine's easy. He's going to have to pay money, right? The penalty points obviously stick around for two years on their record and go against them ahead that would, could ultimately result in a revocation of their CBNC or deny them the ability to reapply. It is a denial of a substantive legal right if not considered by the council and taken up. Um, and, and I would just go back, you know, Councilman Jackson, what you said at the very beginning, I look at it more from a common sense standpoint, is not from my perspective. And I think that a judge looks at it from a common sense standpoint as well. And if you take that into consideration and you think about we're going to reverse the fine. Well, if there was no wrong, there was no wrong, period, to justify any type of penalty. I mean, to me, it would be like saying uh, we find you completely innocent of, of any type of crime, but you still get to go to jail. And I don't think that's fair or right or legal, and I think a court's going to feel that it's the exact same way. I would also point you to uh, the, stat, the ordinance itself, section 341, the introductory paragraph, which says it is the city council's authority, right, to, to review penalty points. They are in the introductory paragraph. There's also conflicts within the body of the ordinance itself in 341. If you look at the preceding paragraph that deals with financial penalties, it says uh, it addresses whether or not a financial penalty can be appealed uh, or not. It states that no appeal can be taken from a city council decision, right? If we look down at the penalty points provision of the ordinance, it says penalty points assessments may not be appealed. It doesn't say from who. It's vague, it's unclear, and it's candidly just, I think that's what a court's going to say. It doesn't clarify who, who a penalty cannot be appealed from. If you look further on down to section 3.43, 
there's actually the complaint procedure outlined there. And in that, it gives the EMS coordinator along with the uh, Ambulance Regulatory Board the ability uh, to assess penalty points, fines, revoke, uh, or, or advise revocation of a CPNC. And it also gives the council in subpart K, following a hearing, the city council may uphold, amend, or overturn the decision of the ARB board. That includes penalty points in that provision of how complaints are to be handled. I think it would be a great mistake for the council not to take those up together. I think it would ultimately result in a, uh, a legal error if that were to be done. And I think he's made that clear of what our options are to be uh, I have several questions. Uh, if anyone else would like to go first, you may. You Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. No? Uh, okay, first response. You clarified that you have to buy the software for the ambulance, each ambulance you have. Um, and then you're saying that 911 does not give you access. Have you ever, since you've been in a business since, was it 12, I think, when you got your business license? Have you ever, have you ever since Fort, uh, when you rolled out that first ambulance had access? No, no. Okay. Uh, G26, 2012 was our first call. Okay. And we've always asked uh, for Opscat because there's a lot, of, a lot of great features that, like I said, as a business owner, you can stay on top of things a little bit better. But uh, we were told that we didn't have it for those security reasons. And that was for the past director, though? Yes. Okay. We, we have discussed it with Ms. Ferris. Uh, and let me just ask before I ask Ms. Ferris, why do you not allow that access? How old is the software in each of your trucks? Uh, it's periodically updated every time that uh, 911 gets an update from their vendor, then we take our computers in and we get updates too. Okay, so if their new software is higher than your software can talk to, are you going to be able to then replace your software to something that can actually communicate with their software? We're all on the same software. When, when she does an update, we do the update right away. Okay. They don't have choice. Okay, yeah. so that, that's in your contract. Okay. Ms. Ferris, I'll ask you a question. Why are they not granted access to that information? Oh, well, if OSCAD has a view on the software, they can run reports earlier than it anyway to view the software. I don't have a problem with them having access to it if they ask the OSCAD portion of it. Um, the MD And then let me go back to since it's the laptop, how old are your laptops? Um, basically, the cases of the laptops can be anywhere between three, four, five, six years old. And with the internal, uh, we deal with the company here in Decatur, and we do all the latest, greatest updates. Because here you know, we had to change to, from the, well, we started out with Windows 7 because that was most compatible. Then we went up to uh, another Windows generation. Now we're on Windows yeah, yeah, 10 now. So every time that 911 says we need newer software, so to speak, um, we just go and they say, say, say this is a little computer, put all new parts in it, so it sits new on the inside. Very good. I do have a question for Chief Ingram. Yes, yes, uh, this spreadsheet that he's providing us in the six was yes. go to five. Okay. Is that your creation or no. his creation? That is a, a, all the times that I submit that are submitted to me at first response go through uh, 911, which is a third party that takes us out of it. Since they have all the times right there readily available, Samantha Sanders, she does she does all these times. She sends us out our times for each month, and then she sends first response times for each month. So that I don't I don't have I don't touch these. Yeah. And Ms. Ferris, I don't, I will let you look if you know. Is this 911 spread? Oh, you got it. Good, good. Is this something that your agency made? Or, okay, so did you send this exact one this, to? This particular one that you're looking at is because First Response requested that we review these 12 calls that were in the police jurisdiction for that time. Okay. So this was created by Samantha with the notes that are on the side as to the arrival time. But yes, this looks very similar to what we provide. 
Okay, then if you can for me, I think Mr. Rod asked at the very first of this. Obviously, the first column are the dates of the call. Second columns, I assume, are the times of the call in. The third column is what? Run number. I'm sorry? 19-0140. Okay, yeah. Okay, and then the next is that, what is that? A call type. A call type, okay. So, rec on this. Okay, the next line, what is that? The address, which I hope you don't have. Yeah, we do, but, okay, the next column? Um, that's the unit that was assigned. The next column, I'm assuming. That's their response time. That's from the time they were dispatched to the first arrival time. For the computer. For the computer. Okay. What is the TH, 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 what is that? Um, that's just a code for transport. That's just an internal um, disposition code. Okay. And the red is the computer time. And then the white column next to the red column is? If, if that's the notes, if there's a white, I'm not sure what their expression is. What I have is like it says auto arrive, this got the notice. I have like a, the first one, for instance, 749 is in the red, 108 is in the yellow within the call 15 seconds after the unit had, I, I don't know what the 108 is. It gives me the full authority to to uh, to approve or deny these. And so, and if I could, that they didn't they didn't challenge these exceptions okay, at the ARB. Sure. Right. So so what exactly the AR what was the the, the ARB said that they recommended the penalty stay in place. Yes, sir. So based on. But if they challenge this, does any of that ever go to the area? They did not challenge these four calls until tonight. I, I didn't even know they was going to challenge these four calls until tonight. And I would love the opportunity, since we talked about the first one, I would love the opportunity to tell you the reason I did not approve the other three calls. And it, I mean, it's, it's, it's just... Well, then I'll ask, would you please tell, me, tell us the reason you did not approve I would love to. Um, Chief, you're going to need to go into the microphone because the camera cannot hear you. Oh, the camera. So, um, just like Mr. Hargett said, we're going to just go on past the first one, and the next one I'm, that I'm that I have is on twelve twenty-five. It's a uh, three. It's on Mud Tavern Road. Yes. All right. So if you look at that one, once again, and I'm just going to go through the process that I go through when I receive these calls. Uh, first of all, I look at the, the, the five or six box right there where it says other ALS units available, which this one is, is blank. But then I look down at the dispatch times. If you look right there, it took over two minutes and 20 seconds to get for a unit to get in route to this. And then when they actually have the opportunity to tell me the exception or the reason they're asking for this exception, right there you can see distance to scene, Google Maps is 14 minute drive. It would have been unsafe to drive any faster. This is what me and David and me and Jason have spoke about many, many times before about placing their trucks outside of different locations, not at their three stations. This is what this is. To me, even if you look at that without with it being blank right there, that's not a reason for me to say, hey, Okay, you, they knew the city, they knew the police jurisdiction when they started this animal service. Actually, the, years ago when they started, they knew everything they was going to have to cover. If you look at the one on Starkey Road, it says the computer radio wasn't responding by the, by the time we changed the batteries and got the computer to respond. We had in route in three to four minutes. The late on scene was due to weather conditions. Why are they not checking their batteries? That's, that's time that they could have been in route the entire time, but they had to wait and change their batteries. 
Well, also, according to that one, didn't it take five minutes to get going? Yes, sir. So they, they, they specifically right there said that they had been in route 30 to 40 minutes, but they had to change their battery. So to me, that means they had to go back inside and get something to come back out. If you look at the one on the Norris Mill Road, once again, it says 14 minute travel time under normal conditions. But if you look, it's three minutes and 14 seconds or 24 seconds is their time from the time of dispatch to the time that is in route. Also, another thing is, is, is they send these calls to me for me to review, along with a lot of other stuff that I have to review with Mr. Tyndall. But Decatur Fire, we're not at 100%, but we don't have time acceptance. We don't have that opportunity. And I'll be happy to answer any other questions you might have. Since you're there today, I'll ask a question. Uh, at the very first, um, it was addressed the eight minute time frame for in city and the 12 foot out. Um, the city of Decatur, and, and this, I'll approach both of my questions for this one. My question was going to be, also you addressed the, not you, the attorney, addressed the national standards. Now, that standard is for firefighters, not ambulance drivers. And I do, I am aware that some ambulances are housed in fire houses that are manned by firefighters. So that national standard is not an ambulance national standard is a fireman national standard, correct? And and if you read that national standard, David answered that question before you move on, so I don't think that's accurate. Are we referring to NFPA 1710? Is that what you're referring to? Where does it say that in, in the ordinance? I'm not clarifying 1710. I'm not asking. This page doesn't want to hear about asking for time, so I'm not going to go into that. But my question is national standards were addressed. 1710 for a paid fire department. Has to be around one basic EMT and an AED. What's your response? Any response to that or Chip's response to that? I, I, I've looked through that ordinance and I've not seen anywhere where it says NFPA 1710. Then why are we, then the ordinance says 12 minutes for PJ. Yeah, well, I, 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 no, no, I'll address, I'll, I'll address, I'll address. I asked why the term yeah. national standards were addressed, and actually if you look at the national standards that you're referring to, it's for firefighters. Yes, ma'am. I, I thought we weren't going to get into all that at the hearing. Well, so I, I think we had a whole other, a whole other, well, I mean, if, I mean, we can. We had a whole, you know, a whole different set, but in the interest of time and what you said at the beginning, I, sk I just skipped it. So well, my, my 7.43 now, I don't think we've cut down any time. Anymore. Yeah, but my, my point that was, was, if that was, my point was version, is that the, the kind of the guidelines at the beginning is we weren't to go into it, so I didn't go into it. Okay. Uh, but we're making clear for the record is the firefighter standards, national standards. Um, my other questions, uh, Chip, since you've been around on this uh, and we had a, 911 board, e, uh, I guess it was the 911 board, what, what, no, not EMS committee. The EMS committee before we have the ARB, which was enacted last year. Is this the first time that first responses had an issue with the time limit, the 90% no. time? No. So this is not a new thing that happened once the new ordinance was passed? Uh, first response has been consistently in compliance with the time standards at two points uh, in their history. One was when D when Dempsey was still in business and they were in competition. They were consistently uh, better times than Dempsey and they always made their times. Uh, they did not make their times to speak of again until after the February um, ARB meeting. Uh, my position is that when they realized that we were going to try to enforce it, they started making their times again, and they've been making their times since then. And what what Mr. Childers argued at ARB, it was not this, the, the CAD system and the, and the difference in the time and the radio versus that. He said it was the cost 
benefit analysis that these outer line areas, they couldn't put trucks out close enough to get to them on time because it cost too much money to have them out there was the argument he used. And he, and he made the same arguments about we need the 59 extra seconds that we're not going into because that was already handled with the orange. But it was the, the fire standards and it was the cost benefit analysis that we don't, we, we can't put people out, put trucks out that far. Uh, and, uh, and I will say that when, when they started, the police jurisdiction was a mile and a half further. So it's since, since they took the job, their distance has been cut down significantly. Yeah, that was approved in 2016 by the prior council. Uh, and I did actually in the February meeting, uh, first response, did, you did at that time give 911 the opportunity to tell you were sent units. And I've actually called, I think Mr. Tindall or one of you, and I, I commended you on it. In fact, there's one that sits in the Kroger parking lot quite regularly. And I'm assuming you're still doing that. They're letting, you're letting 911 tell you, this is a great zone to sit an ambulance in. And I think that's great. I think that's wonderful communication between the two. So thank you for doing that. And thank you 911 for that. Uh, I, let's see, questions there, that's answered. Uh, and let's go back to, it was the, this new ordinance passed in August. It was by law in the in uh, I guess run a, an ad for how long is that legal? The ad ran uh, on August 22nd, and so the ordinance became effective by the provisions of the ordinance 30 days after it was published. So it went into effect September 22nd. Okay, and where was this published at? Daily. Is that the only place it was published? Uh, as far as Stacey would have to tell you, that's the only place we're yes. required to. Okay. That's all my questions. Thank you. Any other from council members? Chip, would you have anything that you'd like to follow just, up? Just basically, I, I think because I, I have a very hard time sitting here and keeping my mouth shut, I think I. I covered what I wanted to, to say the I mean clearly uh, our position all along has been that the automated system is better to test for the very reason that we're here about today people can call and and you don't know if they're there or not um, the the we have mechanisms in place and we have a track history of showing uh, in the first quarter of this year when they presented us with reasons to overturn requested exceptions and brought we made the exception based on problems uh, that they showed with the uh, the computer at that time and what would have been uh, very nearly if not completely a fatal penalty imposed we pulled back as soon as they showed us that there was a problem with the computer uh, in this situation they never made that argument until we got here today. Their argument has been consistently the, you know, we need the extra minute turnout time, which our police, which our fire department does not get. Uh, we, uh, you know, that, that has been the argument, the attacking the ordinance. Um, the, the, they showed in their presentation four instances and I think we've shown that the three they chose to leave out showed more reasons why uh, they should have been upheld. And it is their burden to overturn it. And I think we have shown that we are uh, willing to do that. Um, as, a, as a practical matter, and this is, uh, and, and I understand your position earlier, Paige, when you were talking about, you know, just letting them have the chance and move forward. Um, it, I've, I've been watching this for years, 10 years, how the ambulance system has worked. It is a fact that when they were in competition with Dempsey, they were able to make the times. It is a fact that when they realized we were serious about enforcing, they were able to make the times. I think any action by this council to say, to just wink at the violation would let them know that we're not serious about it 
and we may never get compliance with the time standard again. And for that reason, I'm asking that you uphold it. Anything else from council? President, if I may, just one final comment. Um, I guess in response to Chip there, we, we don't think there's been violations. I know that Chip has pointed to these, and we've looked at three other forms today. We didn't bring those up before the council on appeal at all. We showed you the form that we think is due to be granted an exception that's been provided. The other forms were not. We weren't mm -hmm. arguing about those today. And the other three times that we've already pointed out and the E911s confirmed were verbally responded to and within the 720 seconds. And for that reason, we think that both the penalty and penalty points as well as the fine need to be reversed. Thank you. I guess my question for you is, then why did you even address the four rather than the one complaint? If, if there was four in question, why did you start your comments with we have four there are There are four, but I wasn't talking about the, the forms and the incompleteness of the form and the reason for, and the basis for that denial. I was talking about the radio response that E911 Ms. Ferris confirmed in this room today that we met. And then the other form, the one form that we provided was denied for due, due to be incomplete when it was shown not to be complete and there were justifiable reasons for that to be granted. But you're only bringing us one, you're bringing us one document. But you're using the number four. So really, are you, you should be saying there's one there's time. There's four on the there's document. A, there's, there's one exception, and there's three for the radio response time. Dif different. Yeah, but you did not provide the information he had to go get copies for us. Why not provide? If you're going to say four, why not have the information for four? We, we provided the spreadsheet that was the result of the investigation, the E911, which is what we did provide. But again, it's a separate entity for the city that we do not have I, I know, but I just want it to be clear that we did provide that information in the spreadsheet that was actually done by E911. But you did go to the extent of doing this sheet that had to be copied by our chief. You only provided that one in your packet here. To, to demonstrate the reason for that particular exception, yes, Madam President, that's why I provided well, that. I would copy. appreciate it all four. If you're going to say four, let's have copies of four. Anything else? We can now entertain a motion. Or any just well, let's have a motion first and a second. Uh, we would make a motion first response as the appeal um, of both the penalty points as well as the fine be reversed that the points be taken off in the entirety and that the $10,000 fine uh, be straightened and then reversed as well. Looking for a council. Uh, okay, to get it on the, on the floor so that we can discuss it, I am going to make a motion that the decision of the ARB be upheld. Do you have a second? I'll second. second to get on the floor. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Moore, a second by Mr. Jackson. We can entertain discussion. All right, I'd like to First of all, I want to say this. We're not here to punish you. I want to make that very clear. This isn't about punishment. Uh, second, I applaud the decision to use alternative methods going forward if we're having problems. But if our computer system needs to be upgraded, we need to be doing it. As far as the national standards go, uh, I think we made it very clear that eight minutes is 480 seconds and 12 minutes is, is 720 seconds. And personally, I'm tired of hearing about turnout time. Now, I want to go and I want to talk about this four calls. The, uh, to me, they all took two to five minutes. Two of them took two minutes, one took three, one took five before wheels got rolling. If that were not an issue, you would have made your, your comments on all of them. I'm concerned why you did not ask the ARB to reconsider or at least consider individual responses and why you bring those to us. Um, so if even if I look at the I-65 one, and give you credit for that. The other three, I, I don't see any reason. The uh, the times to get rolling are significantly high. That if you're going to put me in a position to 
to say that, I, I would deny those three. So I would give you the, the one on I-65, but the other three I wouldn't. My opinion. My, um, I think I have never had a problem showing my personal preference. I, I, I am clear in the fact that I, at some point I want us to move completely away from this and run emergency transport through our fire department. I, I've never made a secret of that. Um, and I think that it's more efficient. I think it could be more efficient or would be more efficient. I think that it would, um, the standards are there and, and I think that we could control the standards and, and, um, and, and make sure that things were run the way that we expect them to be run. And that's why my personal preference is there. I have not made a secret either of the fact that I am not a fan of first response. I've just gotten too many complaints from my uh, community, from my citizens, and so I'm not a fan of first response. That being said, I think that there are too many inconsistencies here for me to support this uh, measure tonight, though. I mean, and uh, I, I do want to move in a different direction, but uh, when Ms. Ferris said uh, that the system, it was not always a problem with the system, and she said it's not always a problem. It means there are problems. When uh, she said we, we allow the service to use auto arrive because there can be discrepancies. There can be discrepancies. And, um, you know, those are things that when it comes down to what, whether this auto arrive is accurate or not, it gives me pause and it makes me wonder, is it accurate? So I can't penalize somebody when I don't know that the system is accurate in all accounts. I, I just can't. Um, the verbal, verbal was requested by Ms. Ferris because we couldn't consistently monitor AVL. Uh, went on and requested to ensure that there was consistent, there was a, con we wanted to ensure that there was a consistent way of tracking her words. The form here was, that we have in front of us was uh, incomplete or improperly completed. Uh, that's what's here. It's not in our ordinance. And I don't know that I can support that if it's not in our ordinance and we can't find it in our ordinance. It needs to be in our ordinance. Um, in my opinion, the fine and the points in this particular situation should be overturned. And I, again, it's not because, I, again, David, you know how I feel about it. I'm not a fan of first response, but I think right is right. And I think that our position is that if there's a discrepancy and there is um, a gray area, I think that we have to get it right. We have to have it in our ordinance. We have to make sure that we have a system that's in place. But at this, support, at this particular point, I can't support finding them, giving them points, and I would rather reverse that at this particular time. Can we repeat what the motion was? The motion is to, to as, as stated, to reinforce the ARB decision. To support the ARB. Yes. And I seconded it because I think that I, I felt that we needed to have the discussion. I just wanted to clarify which way we were voting. Yeah. And I want to set, talk about this, and a comment was made earlier about common sense, but I want to talk about the color of what this looks like. And the color in a snapshot of time is going to look altogether different than a snapshot over a period of time. And I first want to make clear, not that it'll affect this issue of Ms. Ferris, she's a professional, she's been nothing but forthright and honest in this whole thing. And this goes back before her time here when a lot of these problems cropped up. So I want to be very clear about that. I'm not throwing them under the bus in any form. I will say, I've been at the 911 board meetings, and she'll tell you I'm a rather religious attendee there. When her predecessor made it clear, there is no way on God's green earth they were going to negotiate that contract, period. That's a fact, and you probably find it in some of the minutes. Now that being said, also the predecessor of the ARB, the MS committee, I attended a meeting down there at Flint when Mr. Ashley's predecessor and another person or two representatives of the city made it clear they changed the exemption forms as a retaliation for a number of them being submitted in one month. Now, that is a tell 
a clue of where the whole thing was going from, from day one, which I've indicated was targeting, okay? I personally held conversation with former Chief Grandy when he said he intended to make a revenue flow out of this company. Now beyond that, the first meeting that we held as a body, and he talked about an alleged violation he found on a non-emergency transport, which our code says we don't monitor non-emergency. On a non-emergency transport, and I asked him, I said, how long does your code give you to notify the, the suspect of an investigation? And he said he didn't know. And I repeated at that time I had read the ordinance and it was five days having to notify. At that time, that one was 60 days and it hadn't yet been notified in writing. We are viewing this code how to apply to a target and yet we don't view this code as something we need to live by. And I have a problem with that. I've got two questions, Mr. Kirby. Uh, if you're saying we're not living by this ordinance, could you be more informative on what When we are supposed to notify him in five days that we, we were investigating and 60 days later we haven't notified him? Do we're you, not following our code. Do you have a time on that? I mean, was that recently when Chief It was upstairs. And you got very mad at me at that particular point in time for saying that. And I think that was Chief Grandy's last meeting or the meeting prior to that. Okay, I'm not quite sure why I got mad. I mean, I can go back. I do record meetings. Um, and he admitted that they pretty much had never sent a notice in writing. I think, all, and Stacy, you would have to answer this. All notifications from the new ordinance, ordinance that's been in effect since October, have we gotten that out properly. I think you had those mailed where it required a signature and I think you called. You're referring to the notices to All notices. Okay. Legal, have y'all made all notices within what's in the guidelines of the new okay. as, as far as I, I know, I don't know of any that have been out of time. And then my other question, Mr. Kirby, is if you if you said you actually heard uh, fire department employees who are employees of the city of Decatur say they were targeting, well that is illegal. Did you make that known to our legal counsel? Because uh, per your oath of office, if you're made aware of a crime or something that is illegal and you don't report it, then you too are then held responsible for that. So you, you, you are confusing comments. I never said they admitted targeting. They admitted that they intended to collect revenue from this company. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, now, I'm when I first heard it, it took a while for it to sink in. I, I just couldn't believe a city official had said that to me, okay? Since then, I've made it clear I've said it, and two people in this council at the meeting I brought that up said, I don't care. I'm gonna leave it alone at that because the points are clear, and I, I think most people's minds are made up how they intend to vote. Do you have a date on when you heard that? I know I heard it for a fact on June the 3rd at a work session last year. Okay, that would be before this new ordinance was in place. This was leading up to this ordinance. Okay. Actually, at that time, I said we weren't meeting the code of the, 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 the code of the old ordinance. How can we do a new one when we're not even meeting the code of the old one? Okay, again, please be clear, maybe it's you know, not understanding. Uh, you're saying we're not meeting our own code, and, and you were saying- We have a track code. record of not meeting our own code. Okay, since mm -hmm. the new one in August that was in place in, I guess, September 22nd. The new one, I pointed out the five-day notice that it says we give, okay. and the five-day notice had never been given on that alleged investigation, and it was 60 days later when I brought it up. Do you have any proof or evidence that since this current ordinance has been passed, that you have a question of if we are abiding by the same standards in it? I said five-day okay. notification. Okay. Now, if you can subpoena their records and show, or our records that show that we notified them five days later, so be it. Okay, give me a time on that, approximately. Mr. Childers, do you remember when that alleged uh, violation concerning the non-emergency transport came up? That was uh, two months before Chief Grant's last meeting. Uh, so Chief Grant's last meeting, I think, was in March. I think uh, Chief Thornton uh, took it. Uh, 
And I'm not trying to throw the current people here under the bus. I'm just saying we don't expect a high standard of ourselves. I mean, I'm going to need more of a definition of that. I mean, what are you thinking? We're not when we say thousand. that we will give you notice in five, in five days of investigating something and 60 days later we haven't given that notice, why not? But that was in, before this no, ordinance. No, that's in this ordinance. I know that Mr. Children said it was two months before Chief left, which would have been in, can you say, November, I think, Chief Thornton took it over. So that'd be that that be chief adoption. had helped allegedly work on this ordinance at that point in time. Okay, I'm still I'm not very clear. I'm sorry. It's probably the time. Any other comments? Miss Hill, let's just double check. Miss Hill, are you there? Okay. And as I said before, I was uh, ready to come in and, and kind of give at least a thought to reducing it and taking away the points. But unfortunately for me, when in writing, and this would occur, Ms. Ferris, that you could provide that written documentation that in 2015 it was requested by first response that they go by the auto time and not voice time. Um, and, and for me, that it's written evidence. And, and I wish, I wish, I wish you had gone in and written something uh, that negated that and said, no, we want to go by voice because we're concerned with some of the issues of the software. I'm with you. And I'm glad that they're updating their software because, again, we have a contract with them outside of y'all. Y'all have a contract with 911 outside of us. And so I want the best for the city of Decatur. So I want 911 for your sake, my sake, the residents' sake to be as the best they can be. Uh, and I encourage that. And I think Chief Allen, I don't think he's here. I think he was. And as far as negotiating a contract, we negotiated our last budget contract with them. They came in with a higher per call number. And our, both of our chiefs went and said, we just aren't going to pay that. And, I, and they did make arrangements for They said so they negotiated that contract. Um, so I know negotiations with 911. It may not have been with the last director. I can't speak for that. I can only speak for Ms. Ferrison now. So negotiations did take place. And again, I'm sorry. I, was, I, was, I came in here with the intentions of uh, either cutting that fine or uh, saying, you know what, let's get everything as fine as we, but that written that written documentation once she can provide that i just wish you had written and rescinded that and it has to go sure everybody makes mistakes we make mistakes going to the auto arrive okay but the groups in the way we made the call group we made the call yes it was a mistake for us to write this uh communication to Ms. Ferris about the auto arrive but we still have to look at the and again, I wish that you had written or sending a text to her, or because that would have definitely changed my mind. So, um, we have a motion. Any more discussion? Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Arden, a second by Mr. Jackson, to uphold the ARB's recommendation for these fines and the points. Um, roll call. Aye. 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 No. Kirby. No. You yes. didn't call everybody. No, check that at 751. Okay. 751-2-0. Uh, that does not have the appropriate amount of votes to go forward. So that will either need to be, um, I guess Ms. Hill can ask for that to be considered again. Um, we will get the legal, uh, I guess, information. Well, okay. it, it doesn't pass. It, it doesn't. No, it doesn't with this one. If it, would, if it needs to be brought back up, it will need to be addressed it one way or the other, because if not. That didn't pass, you no. move on to the overturn. So it will not, so it, it will or will not be overturned. Overturn, we're going to have the same. Do we still go through that? Because voting to uphold, it's I, still in place, waiting to be upheld. Yeah. So my question is, with the two-two, there is no decision. So is the ARB decision going to be maintained, or I'm not sure where it goes. It would, no. It, it's on appeal. No. We it would have, arguably, it would have to come back up at another one, maybe. <laughs> it does, well, if none of the three pass. No, I'm not talking about this one alone. 
she was arguing that all three end up 2-2, two, two, so then what happens to it? So it's, it's dead at this point. Yeah. There's a 2-2 vote. It was not upheld. Right, Therefore, but, the but they still move on with the other two votes, and if those end up 2-2, two, two, then nothing happens. Just curious. No, we, we excuse me. Okay. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Your question. I don't mind. I, I interrupted. I'm sorry. Um, and this is a legal question. Ms. Hill was on the con call, but she did drop out at 7:51. You said, Stacy. Yeah. Uh, Richard. Let me. Richard. Thank you. My, my phone's dead. I will. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Richard Hill was on the So, so some of y'all got a text? I don't know. My phone is dead. If you'd like to see it. I it did not get a text. Like to see it. I don't get a text. Mm -hmm. No, I don't care. Okay. Okay. And I will show it. I don't care. We're good. Thank no, you. Okay. okay. So, thank you. So my question is to you legally, since Ms. Hill dropped out at 751, can she ask to revisit this because she didn't get a vote on it. I'm mean, just asking legally. I have no idea what the answer no. is. No. It, it, one of the people that voted, I don't know who who would determine is on the winning side. The person on the winning side can ask for it to be reconsidered, but there's not a winning side and she wasn't here to vote. So. Okay, well then you're going to have to legally tell us which side would then have to request a revisit to this. This is a little different. Yeah, which do you consider the winning side? <laughs> well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna well sure. if either one of the others for whatever reason passes then that would that would resolve the issue I'm sorry one of the other what I'm sorry. the the motion to overturn or the motion to modify if either one of them passed then that would resolve the issue you may not and if you don't I would, then I would, it I would make a motion that since we are at any motion is going to have the means, same two two. That means that it, no, not necessarily, that the motion was defeated. And in my mind, the, the penalty and the points should go away. Correct. I agree with that. I mean, so I, that's I just procedural. Right. That's fine. It, it I, we, it's, it's not upheld, so I, that, that makes logical okay. sense. I just want to make sure legally there's nothing right. that they can come right. back say. Yeah. Right. Very good. Okay. Now we get to go to the official. You, you say we have to have. No, if, if you wanted to go to one of the others, you could, but I All think. Right. I think. Okay. Right. So, what yeah. happens to the penalties and the uh, points, uh, Chip? Well, they here or gone? They were not upheld. Okay. Okay. Let's go to we debatements. We'll try to run through this quickly. They'll, uh, they'll never make their time again. Do I have a motion to. I'm going to be nice. Let's just do them all at once. Okay. And so I that would have them done in the future, not by district. So that's your motion. I, I'll be okay, okay if we just delete the districts now oh. and take them all as one. We'll handle them all short. Okay. okay. Legal, did you hear that request? I did not. Okay, if you could, and Herma, I don't know if you're still on the line. If in the future, uh, just put them, don't. Uh, as they come in. We need to vote on that. David Lee probably needs to be notified. Okay. Okay. They've always been itemized like this for a reason, so uh, okay. well, not always. Mr. Yeah, that's right. Okay, Mr. Jackson has made a motion to take these all at once. Do I have a second? Yes. Mr. Kirby, a second. Any discussion? So we're talking District 1, 2, and 3. Okay, uh, these resolutions assess fines against uh, homes for nuisances. Do, can I have a motion for that? Do you have any questions? Uh, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Kirby, have done that. Roll call, please. And we're doing all from District 1 through 3, is that correct? Every single way to make it, yes. Chip, do they have to be read or is the printed acceptable in front of us? No, I think the printed is acceptable. Roll call. Bibby? Aye. R. Aye. Jackson? Aye. Kirby? Aye. Okay, those all pass. Uh, District 1, 2, and 3 of weed abatements, 4 to 0. Set public hearings in the future, resolution 2153, abatement of unsafe conditions at 220 Fifth Avenue Northwest. Set public hearing for August 3rd, 2020 at 6 p.m. 
Mr. Lee, I'm not sure if he's still on the line, but he said earlier nothing had changed. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's just sure. Resolution 2154, by the way, said consent to date two Seventh Avenue Southeast. Public hearing set for August 3rd, 2020 at 6 p.m. Ordinance number 24413, rezoning request 135420, set public hearing to be held on August 3rd, 2020 at 6 p.m. Ordinance number 24414, rezoning request 1355-20, set public hearing to be held on August 3rd, 2020 at 6 p.m. Resolution number 2165, emergency sirens upgrade in the amount not to exceed $70,000. Requested, that would be for tonight. That would be a resolution, but not, not a public hearing. I the public hearing. You can talk about the 2165. 20-165, which are the emergency signs. No. So we need a motion for that this evening. That is not a public hearing. Which page in order? I'm confused. Page three, the top. Okay. Four, four, six, no, I have 2165, okay. emergency signs. And we must have skipped a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. I do. I, I do not have a page four. So that uh, would be. Right. So that's uh, one of those lucky days. Okay. All right. All right. And that is a public Thank you. Um, After you do that last morning. Yes. Well, wait a minute. Let's see. Let me see what is on my page two. Well, we skipped all fixes and. Zoning and everything. Uh, well, then I'm going to need a, 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 a copy that's correct, if, if that's the case. The one I had my notes on was the one I read in pre-meeting. Stacy, no can you confirm that we've done 224414? Yes. So you need to pick up 4416. Okay. Top of the page. Ordinance number 24416, rezoning request 135720, set public hearing to be held on August 3rd, 2020 at 6 p.m. Public hearings for this evening. Resolution 2155, approve request for resident, resident retail liquor license for, and Sal, I think he's gone. I'm, I'm, I'm here, Ms. Baby. Oh, Sal, uh, help me with that name, please. I don't want to put you on. Uh, yes, ma'am. Chapala Jalisco Mexican Grill. Great. Uh, LLC at 1820 6th Avenue, Unit N, Decatur, Alabama, 35601. Yes, ma'am. This is a request for a new license. It's already an existing restaurant located at the Gateway Shopping Center, and this license is recommended for approval. Okay. I have a motion. Oh, no. that's a public hearing. Public hearing. Uh, this is being time and place of the public hearing. If anyone from the public would like to speak, we will continue that now. No one from the public wanted to speak. We'll declare this public hearing closed. Entertain a motion from Mr. Ricard. Second. Second by Mr. Kirby. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Aye. Aye. Jackson. Aye. Aye. Uh, someone has got some background noise on the recording. Please check for me. That passes resolution 2155420. Resolutions for this evening. Uh, I do not have a, a resolution. 169. Okay. 169. Approval request by T Mobile for a 180 day extension of the modification equipment on the existing Mono Pine Tower located at 1406 Chapel Street, Southwest, Decatur, Alabama. Uh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. You to go ahead. That's above and beyond the duty right there. <laughs> this is Tab. Every, everyone is calling in and responding right now on staff level. I'm so proud of okay. I've hung in there. One As moment. am I at all. One moment, sir. We're being addressed by Jeff. Thank you. Go ahead, Jeff. Sorry. This was an application uh, uh, that was actually submitted some time ago and it went past the time to get this completed due to, I think, the, the merger between T-Mobile and Sprint. And so basically T-Mobile was wanting to ask for an extension. So nothing has changed from the application and what they want to do. They're currently on this tower and they just want to go forth with that work. So nothing has changed and what it is, they're going to remove six antennas and they're going to replace those with six new antennas and basically just going to help with the signal in that area. So moved. Motion by Mr. Kirby, second by Mr. Arn. Any discussion? Roll call. 
Debbie. Aye. R. Aye. Jackson. Same. Oh, sorry, Kirby. Aye. That motion uh, post passes uh, six to one. Uh, I'm sorry, three, three to one. Three to three one. one. Yeah. Thank you for your patience. Resolution 2156, approval of 2019 community, community development cap, caper or to HUD. Allen. So yes, ma'am. We've got a motion by Mr. Jackson, a second by Mr. R. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Bibby. Aye. R. Aye. Jackson. Aye. Kirby. Aye. Resolution 2156 is approved with a vote. Thank you, Allen. Four to zero. Resolution 2157 assess demolition costs in the amount of 4000 494 against 1039 East Bolton Street Southeast. So moved. Motion by Mr. Kirby. Second. Second by Mr. R. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Debbie. Aye. Aye. R. Aye. Jackson. Aye. Kirby. Aye. Resolution 2157 has been approved 4 to 0. Resolution 2158 assessed demolition cost in the amount of $4,180 against 1612 Chestnut Street Southeast. Motion by Mr. R. Second. Second by Mr. Kirby. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Baby. Aye. R. R. Jackson. Aye. Kirby. Aye. Resolution number 2158 approved 4 to 0. Resolution number 2159 assessed demolition cost in the amount of $10,885 against 1819 Corinne Avenue Southwest. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Kirby. Second by Mr. R. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Aye. Aye. R. Jackson. Aye. Kirby. Aye. Resolution 2159 has been approved 4 to 0. Resolution 2160 approved MOU between the Juvenile Probation Office and DYS for transportation. Motion by Mr. R. Second. Second by Mr. Jackson. Any discussion? Roll call. Baby. Aye. R. Jackson. Aye. Kirby. Abstain. Resolution number 20-160 was approved three and one three to zero one abstention. Resolution 2161 approved a budget adjustment to transfer funds between SES expense accounts. So moved. Motion by Mr. Kirby, do you have a second? Second. Second by Mr. R. Discussion. Can anyone remember what John explained to us in this? I don't have my notes in front of me. He gave us whatever Cause yes, this. Yes. I'm, I'm still here. All right, John. Uh, there was a, a temporary vacancies in street and environmental. I, I believe there were three of them. Uh, Ricky needed to fill them, so we filled them with temporary employees. This transfer transfers money out of the payroll to the tra uh, temporary employees line that covered those costs. Thank you, John. Sorry about that. Any other discussion? No, no problem. Roll call, please. Eddie. Aye. R. Jackson. Aye. Kirby. Aye. Resolution 2161 is approved 4 to 0. Resolution 2162, approved vacation request 519 20. Second. Motion by Mr. R. Second by Mr. Kirby. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Debbie. Aye. R. Aye. Jackson. Aye. Kirby. Aye. Resolution 2162 has been approved with a vote of 4 to 0. Resolution number 22163, approved vacation request 520-20. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Jackson, second by Mr. Kirby. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Baby. Aye. R. Aye. Jackson. Aye. Kirby. Aye. Resolution 2163 is approved with a vote of 4 to 0. Resolution number 2164, approved parks and recreation organizational restructure. So moved. Motion by Mr. Kirby, do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Mr. R. Any discussion? Roll call. Is, is, is Rochelle on the line? Rochelle, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Does this, does this have, I've heard so many different stories, is this cost neutral? The answer is yes. Okay, John, can you verify that? What was what was that question again, sir? The reorganization, the the parks and recreation, 
you've verified that it is basically cost neutral? Uh, yes, sir. It's about a about a savings of about nine thousand yeah, dollars based neutral. on. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Motion, Mr. Kirby. A second, Mr. Hardy. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Maybe. Aye. 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 Jackson. Aye. Kirby. Aye. 4-0, resolution 2164 is approved. Resolution number 2165, emergency sirens upgrading the amount not to exceed $70,000. Second. Second. Mr. Ard, second second Mr. Kirby. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Maybe. Aye. Ard. Aye. Jackson. Aye. Kirby. Aye. Resolution 2165 has been approved 4 to 0. Resolution number 2168 designates City Clerk to perform Mayor's election duties pursuant of Code of Alabama 1975, Section 11 4636. Motion by Mr. Ard. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Kirby. Any discussion? And roll call, please. Baby. Aye. Ard. Aye. Jackson. Aye. Kirby. Aye. Resolution 2168 has been approved 4 to 0. Ordinances for this evening, ordinance number 24399, Model Airplane Club lease at landfill. First reading on this 31620. Mr. Ard made a motion. Second. Second by Mr. Kirby. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Baby. Aye. Ard. Aye. Jackson. Aye. Kirby. Aye. Ordinance Center 24399, approved 420. Boards and committees reappoint Ms. Barbara Kelly, Historic Preservation Second. Commission. Second. Motion by Mr. Jackson, second by Mr. R. Discussion? Roll call? Baby. Aye. R. Jackson. Aye. Aye. That appointment has been approved 420. Uh, okay. All opposed to be shot. Thank you. Stay Thanks, so much. Really? I thought we had. Two and to all in the room. She brought them down. Thank you, guys. Okay. Gotcha.